Town Board, we are live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the April 4th work session of the East Hampton Town Board. Carol, would you please read the roll call? Present. Present. Here. Present. Present. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. Before we get started, I'd like to read a statement from the East Hampton Town Police Department regarding the school swatting incident. Uh, this is criminal harassment uh, called in bomb threat. Uh, many East End schools received a threatening email overnight, which was similar in wording to the mass email sent to other school districts across New York uh, State over this past week. Law enforcement intelligence deemed the threat to be non-credible and part of a robo-email scheme, but out of an abundance of caution, the East Hampton Town Police Department deployed teams of officers to each school to complete a thorough search and clear each building. We've been in constant contact with school district leadership the state and county police throughout this incident, uniformed police officers have been deployed to the schools and we are monitoring any further intelligence. We applaud the quick and professional response of our local school district's leadership and want the community to know that clear communication and cooperation between police and schools is routinely tested for situations such as this. Um, you know, it's a disturbing, I guess, commentary on where we are as a, as a nation. Um, but uh, this is the type of thing that that does happen uh, from time to time. And uh, we have the full faith and confidence in our local law enforcement to deal with these types of situations in the school districts as well. Um, it's unfortunate that we train for these types of situations and do drills. Um, but that's the state of affairs at this time. And hopefully we will see things improve. Um, Moving on now, today we have a number of topics to discuss. We'll have bids presented by Jeannie Carroza, a draft code changes uh, uh, relating to GeoCubes, Brian Frank, the UR map modifications. We have two of those, uh, one at Glen Valley Associates, the other is 59 Gardeners Avenue, followed by liaison reports, and we do have a few resolutions. Uh, but first, we'll have a public comment where any member of the public may address the board on any topic. We ask that you please keep your comments to three minutes or less. We do have a sign-up sheet, um, and after I go through the sign-up sheet, I will take by show of hands anyone else who would, would, would like to address the board, and we also will likely have callers on the line, and I'll go to them as well. Uh, first up, we have Kevin McAllister. <coughs> Morning, Kevin. Good morning, Supervisor, Town Board. My name is Kevin McAllister. I'm founder of Defend H2O, uh, based in Sag Harbor. Uh, Sylvia, I want to thank you and Peter for your service uh, for all these years. I know it's a little early and you still have a ways to go, but uh, thank you in advance. So uh, appreciate all that you've done. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, a bit of a preamble to... Um, uh, the presentation on the geotextiles. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit. Uh, coincidentally, last week I sent out uh, basically an update on a, a regulatory review that we had conducted uh, looking at a state level as well as municipal level. And there was actually a photograph of a a uh, pretty elongated geotextile structure uh, basically laced together. Uh, pretty uh, impressive and impressive as, as far as a feature and its impacts on the beaches, of course. So this is Quag. I know East Hampton's grappling with it. I certainly have been speaking to it. Uh, I, I just want to commend the town for taking this on. I don't know the substance of the 
code amendments, what's what's proposed, but uh, taking a hard look at geotextile is so important. Uh, New York State, uh, quite frankly, the DEC is all over the place. Uh, I've looked at about 25 permits in Quag alone. Um, you know, they talk about uh, not interfering with the uh, uh, exchange of sand between the uh, dune and the beach, and yet that photograph speaks volumes. You know, maintaining coverage on them, temporary structures, um, the same thing the town's grappling with. So to the extent that you take this on, it's so important. You've heard me speak about shoreline hardening, of course. Uh, geotextiles, as I like to say, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's every bit uh, a steel sheet pile as, as well as a stone revetment. So uh, thank you for taking it on. I look forward to Brian's presentation. Uh, I'd like to support any meaningful changes to uh, uh, further, I'll say, restricting their permanent placement. Because uh, lastly, the geotextiles, when they uh, do fail, and inevitably they will, um, it will morph into stone, and then it, it really becomes permanent. And this notion that these are temporary is, you know, just out the window. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Rob uh, Stay Stamus? Stanich. I'm sorry, Stash. Morning. I'm uh, Rob Stanich, Montauk dad, outdoorsman, fisher, hunter, oyster husband, surfer, hiking, hiker, mountain biker, dog walker, no particular order. I spoke here March 7th in favor of the uh, keeping the town game lands open for the uh, tur spring turkey season. For following the DEC policy setting, it's literally an outside authority, our own state government, uh, and debunking some of the safety concerns around it. Um, but I want to talk about something a little bit different today. Um, I was actually he glad to hear that there is a, a counter petition, you know, circling um, to ban the turkey season. I fully support uh, the other side's right to air their ideas. Uh, just not to impose their will on us. Um, I say if you think it's wrong to eat meat, don't eat it. If you think it's wrong to hunt, don't hunt. Um, I like turkeys. I also enjoy watching them. I've heard uh, a lot of comments on that. Uh, they're also delicious. I love a good turkey BLT. I love smoked turkey with a brie and honey mustard. And of course, who amongst us doesn't uh, you know, love Thanksgiving dinner with our, our loved ones? Now, I could question the veracity of an online petition. It's on a website that's open to anonymous submissions. Basically, anyone who can create an email address can sign that thing. And to her credit, we did hear the organizer uh, admit uh, a couple weeks ago that there were many bogus submissions in there, which she has tried to uh, filter out. But she's also counting city people. Um, if they had gathered a million signatures by now, that wouldn't surprise me. It doesn't matter. Um, the very fact that I can go online, I can recruit my PETA and my Extinction Rebellion friends to come sign my petition is like another demonstration of we're being attacked by outsiders, right? It's completely tone deaf to have done that. Um, to get, you know, keyboard warriors from out there to come spam what had been kind of a serious dialogue we're, we're speaking about locally. Uh, man, I've gotten a civics lesson from watching these sessions the last few weeks. Hunting, mega mansions, Airbnbs, accessory housing, truck beach, the airport, the gun club, outside values, outside money, outside attorneys. Um, the people of East Hampton feel like they're, they're under attack. And I think that's a common theme, even though we disagree about many of these things. Um, a lot of people are, are afraid of the change and they're afraid of, you know, seeing our local traditions, got, you know. Uh, get attacked. So I don't envy your position having to uh, sit here and listen to me and also some of the uh, other uh, quackery and misinformation that's out there. Um, I feel like we hunters need to do more to educate you know, the public because there is so much information. I heard that people don't like hunting and they would literally do anything to obstruct it, law be damned. I heard a woman say she'd rather see a turkey get eaten alive by a menagerie of predators <laughs> rather than end up on my, on my dinner table. That, that, is, that, is, that is terrible. I heard a woman complain that the sound of January gunfire in the bottomlands scares her dogs. Anyone who has spent a winter here knows what that is. Is, you know, are ducks next? Are ducks sentient? Is it going to be fish that we can't fish anymore? They'll stop at nothing. And they plan to show the level of disrespect they have for you and for me by staging a protest here uh, next Thursday. Uh, you have to be here, but I will be as far away from, uh, from here as possible. So please, uh, this Thursday, vote your conscience, uh, but also please consider your constituents. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Captain Joe McBride. Uh, 
Good morning, Joe. How you doing, Pete? Uh, oh, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is, almost afternoon. In any case, I'm here representing the Montauk Boatman and Captains Association to support the position of the East Hampton Sportsman Alliance regarding traditions that are vitally important to the, the town of East Hampton. And one of the reasons many of us come out here because the culture, the society, the activities enticed us to go here and come here um, between fishing and hunting and other outdoor activities, which I personally enjoy very much. So we would like to let the town board know that we support fully the position of the East Hampton Sportsman Alliance, and we will do whatever we can to see that these traditions are continued within our community. And thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you, Joe. Um, thank you. I have Terry O'Reardon here. I see Terry's not here, though. There's somebody uh, she... not here. He has to read his speech. Yeah, so Bill, yeah, if you want to. Bill O'Leary, yep. uh, reading for Terry. And Terry is the president and co-founder of the East Hampton Sportsman's Alliance, as I'm sure you know. <coughs> I'm Terry. At previous town board meetings, East Hampton Sportsman's Alliance and supporters have stood up for the DEC's decision to have a 2003 spring wild turkey season in Suffolk County for the entire month of May. This has, here it comes, shaken a lot of nests, <laughs> ruffled a lot of feathers, <laughs> and resulted in people flocking to town meetings when this topic is expected to be discussed. Thank you very much. <laughs> this spring season has already existed for many decades in much of the rest of New York State. East Hampton town employees and town officials have carefully approved a few designated town-owned areas for small game hunting. These town properties have been used for over a decade for a youth spring turkey season without a single recorded adverse incident. The same with fall turkey season, no recorded incidents. These specifically designated town-owned lands have been available for small game hunting for many years, and these same lands could now be used by licensed wild turkey hunters for this new opportunity. The East Hampton Sportsman's Alliance supports the state DEC's decisions. decision. Hunters are fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, politicians, doctors, lawyers, professional educators, volunteer fire and rescue people, accountants, tradespeople, public service workers, and even CEOs. The point, Terry's point, hunters are people too. The foundations of hunting regulations in America were initiated by hunters and conservationists who saw that the unregulated taking of game, fish, and shellfish was putting many species imminently close to total extinction. Our alliance reveres our natural bounty of plants and animals of all kinds. We've worked with the DEC to rejuvenate and reintroduce indigenous species such as quail, wild turkey, hard clams, scallops, oysters, etc., to keep a long standing ecological balance in place and basis of food and income. The East Hampton Sportsman's Alliance would like newcomers to assimilate with our local traditions and not dismiss conservation efforts that have worked here in this town for decades and centuries. The amount of town-owned properties that could be available for the proposed spring turkey season is a very small percentage of all the town-owned properties. The East Hampton Sportsman's Alliance hopes the board can support this opportunity for our local hunting community. Terry Arreard. Thank you, Bill. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak? David Buda? Good morning, David Buda. I see that on your work 
session agenda. You have two urban renewal map modifications. <clears throat> I have reviewed all of the records that are pertinent, and I thank you again for making them available in advance of your work session meetings by posting them on the town website. This is a system that is working, and a similar process should be used for your regular meetings as well. So the documents that are pertinent can be reviewed in advance. I only have two comments. I realize that you're going to discuss these matters at length with various people from the town uh, presenting them. So I'll be listening carefully. But I only want to just highlight two concerns that I uh, have. With regard to the uh, map modification on behalf of Glen Valley Associates, there's nothing in the paperwork to indicate that the planning board has specifically required and recognized the need that in this open space subdivision that the reserve that is being created must be conveyed to the town. It's not stated anywhere in the planning board resolution. I'm sure Mr. Jolnicki is well aware of the requirements of the open space um, code. Uh, that the, the, Any reserve that's required to be created has to be conveyed either to a uh, homeowners association, in this case, it's only two lots, so there isn't going to be one, or to the town or to uh, a uh, environmental organization suitable to take ownership, uh, not ownership, but management responsibilities for the property. So that should be specified. Also, in the proposed uh, modification to the urban renewal map, there's no specific mention of the retention of the obligation to have a 50 foot wide scenic easement along the frontage. There is a one lot that is excluded. Which frontage? I'm so sorry, David. What? Which frontage? Which lot? Uh, the frontage of Old Northwest Road. Thank you. Um, there is one lot, a corner lot, that is, ex well, even though it may have been purchased by the same entity, it was not part of the subdivision process, and that's their choice. I think it was a mistake not to merge it into the subdivision, make it a three lot subdivision, but you know, oh, you can't tell people what to do with their property in some regards. All I wanna do is make sure that the 50 foot scenic easement requirement that will severely impinge upon that corner lot, the requirement is retained on the urban renewal map. The other one that you're gonna to discuss today involved 59 gardeners at, uh, 59 Gardeners Avenue, and let me just highlight something that's not in the papers that you were presented with in advance. The whole problem arose from the fact that an up island developer didn't apparently know how to read carefully and properly the urban renewal maps and propose an access that they're not allowed to, that would unfairly and improperly impinges upon two town properties and proposed to have a private driveway cut right down the middle of two town properties where the urban rule map specified that the town was entitled to merge those two properties by abandoning the road, <coughs> the paper road between them. The two properties, one is a circular park that was on the original subdivision map going back to 19. Uh, 11, and the other one was a property that the town acquired about 2004, 2005 as an open space um, parcel. Those two pieces now create a contiguous open space that is a bene benefit to the town and the community and the environment. The developer didn't understand it. He decided to put his garage on what some would say is the wrong side of the house, but he was told by the building department before one stick of wood was put in, on the ground or in place, that it had made a mistake. But apparently they didn't understand. So instead, they continued to build the house as originally designed. But they have suitable alternative access. They've actually cleared access from the southeast corner of the property. There's no need for this uh, proposed urban rule map modification. And I don't know why it's still being pursued. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else? Yes, sir. And then I'll go to you, ma'am, afterwards. <clears throat> Good morning. Nick Greco, Amagansett. Today you will discuss geocubes. The town is seeking to amend the emergency section of the code for a more rigorous review of the initial installation of geocubes and make further changes that makes it easier for their removal. The town should also take this opportunity 
to amend the code to provide a section that is fully fair and addresses the actual way that geocubes are being utilized, the last line of defense for many properties. Seems like the code was written for a one-time event where geocubes can be utilized to, to, um, to temporarily shore up properties, and then those properties can be restored to their pre-erosion state and geocubes can be safely removed. In that, in that case, the six month plus three month duration works just fine. But we know based upon photos that Brian and the planning department have prepared and will be presented today, and discussions with this board on prior occasions, that the target of these tow code changes are the properties that need the geocubes because there may be no other alternatives available to effectively protect their properties. Two additional issues should be addressed with this potential code change. First is the duration of the permit. The building inspector already has discretion to authorize any one of up to five emergency activities. Using the additional input that the planning department recommends, discretion should be granted to the building department to determine a realistic duration of the permit. The, this duration could be aligned with the actual site emergency, the feasibility of proposed solutions to manage the emergency, and the time required to implement implement a permanent solution. In any scenario requiring town approvals or an NRSP, the duration from start to completion is on the order of years, not months. And it, uh, the nine month total duration of the code is entirely inadequate. The second issue is a requirement that the geocubes be removed on a statutory basis, irrespective of any extenuating circumstances. Even if permanent solutions are being sought, there's no guarantee that these solutions can be timely approved or even can be completed in the time period for which the permit exists. Under these circumstances, why would the town cause the removal of those geocubes with no consideration of the underlying emergency that still exists and that required them in the first place? The code should allow for the building inspector to extend the permit duration and forego the removal while the underlying emergency still exists based upon specific facts for a specific piece of property. Forcing the removal of the geocubes that function as the only protection of homes solely because the permit has expired would be entirely punitive to the homeowner, especially when the town has done little or nothing to assist these homeowners in their plight. The code should be fair and balanced. It should be a fair and balanced set of rules that the whole town follows. And as we know, though, there's no one-size-fits-all solution to everything. The emergency activity section is no different. It should be revised to reflect, reflect the everyday challenges felt by property owners fighting erosion. Those same property owners shouldn't have to fight the town as well for a fair chance to protect their properties. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greco. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to address the board? Please come to the podium and state your name for the record. Um, Jolie Parcher, East Jolie. Hampton with the business in Amagansett. And um, there's been a lot of buzz. Well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to you all because there's a lot of stuff I've been feeling overwhelmed with in town and you know way more than I do. <laughs> and you have people asking you for things. So I really respect and appreciate your hard work and giving us giving us this good time to talk. But there's been a lot of buzz at the yoga studio on Mandala Yoga in Amagansett Square because of this big house that's going up on the back parking lot. I don't know if you've seen it. And at first we were all saying, is, is someone really building a hotel there? Or is this a new business complex that we didn't hear about? And, you know, but no, it's somebody's house. I mean, I don't know if any of you have seen it. I don't estimate well, but I mean, it's huge. And we're, it's going to overlook the parking lot and I'm against it square and whatever landscaping they do. And it just called, caused a lot of conversation at the studio. Um, and I ended up reaching out to Jane Merring, who I know you know and love. And um, we had a meeting at Scoville Hall on Friday night, and there were over 75 people there. And people were, you know, it was a messy meeting. You know, people were talking and frustrated and whose job was coming up, how we do this and hopelessness and is there a change? And, you know, I spoke up there and I said, you know, I didn't know this was my job 
to speak up and say, I, I, that's my naivete. I didn't know I should show up here. I thought that was happening. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm a yoga teacher. I kind of assume, you know, a lot of peace and love, but, you know, and so there's 75 people who are wanting to come up and say, what the heck, you know, somebody said about the um, hunting, like, when you come to this town, can you respect the traditions of this town, the quality of life, why you came here, the look of this town, you know, the amount of resources that are, are being used to tear down and then rebuild and the workers that are coming and driving up island and the products that's coming and the water usage and whatever heat you're leaving your house on all year because maybe I'm wrong, but that person's not living out here. They're not going to live out here. They're going to come for a month. Um, and I just, I really, uh, I hope it's not too late. You know, how many people do we know that have moved? How many people, how many employees do you need in the government? Teachers that have left because they can't afford to live here. And I think a big part of it is our zoning code. And there was a big cry at the meeting for, what's the code? 20,000 square feet is our maximum in Shelter Island. What is it? 6,000 in Martha's Vineyard. It's 25 or 2,600. Like, you know, and so there's a big call for, can we relook at it and change this code? And we need a moratorium on building or our giant building until we figure this out. Because, I mean, all of us could be somebody that, that has to leave and desperately does not want to leave. Um, and I also wanted to say that at the chili chow down the other day, it was the hunter's chili that was the freaking best one there. <laughs> so I just want to say in terms of respecting what is here, there's plenty of room and, you know, but, but let's, let's get on this. Uh, hopefully it's not too late. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for coming in, Jolene. Anyone else in the room like to address for yes, Steve? Good morning, supervisor and town board members. My name is Steve Griffiths. I'm here to show my support for the upcoming turkey season for myself, all the other hunters, especially the youth of our community. I'm not sure of the number of youth, but there are more youth hunting here in East Hampton than I realized. Just one example is a graduate from our high school joined the East Hampton Fire Department. He was assigned to my company while take, talking to other hunters in the company. He joined the conversation and mentioned, mentioned he hunted. I was pleasant, pleasantly surprised. I feel we have to find things for our citizens to do. After all, everyone doesn't want to go play paddle ball, tennis, golf, volleyball, softball, or complain about everything other people do. <laughs> the group that is opposed to this season will try to make you believe the woods will be filled with hunters at the same time the trails will be filled with hikers. All hunters don't tr tricky hunt. All hunters don't hunt waterfowl. I don't know a hunter who would set up his waterfowl decoys on a hiking trail. <laughs> and all hunters don't deer hunt. I go for walks with my wife and our lab puppy, mainly down in Northwest. There are many times we don't see other hikers. Some days you don't even see another car, let alone a hiker. There's one trail in the Grassy Hollow area that was cleared, and now you can't even find it. With all the seasons we have to hunt, we've all gotten along. There is no reason why that would change by adding this season. Some people may say turkey, venison, and waterfowl doesn't taste good. But cooked right, the wild game is just as good as any meat you can buy in the store. Besides that, everyone doesn't want to eat tofu. Thanks again, and remember, bog against the world. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Anyone else in the audience? Yes. Yeah. Bill, you have comments of your own? Yes. So I'm Bill O'Leary, speaking for myself uh, this time. I'm a vice president of the East Hampton Sportsman's Alliance. And um, so I'd like to share here what I think are important counterpoints uh, against intervening with the proposed intervening uh, to prevent the spring turkey hunting season here. Uh, there are five easy ones and one hard one to refute. Uh, number one, uh, should you intervene uh, due to concerns over safety? No. Turkey hunting has been going on right here in East Hampton for 14 years already. 
with shared trails, as Steve just said, already we get along just fine. Uh, hiking goes on year round here. And there have been no safety incidents. There's no reason that that should be uh, a topic. Personally, I doubt that many people have even noticed actual turkey hunting going on over these 14 years, despite the outcry. Number two, does it justify intervening in the process because of noise and gunshots? Not really. We all appreciate silence, but in this case, it would be one shot for the entire season, two at the most for each hunter. If the hunter went out, if he pulled off getting into a pre-scouted off the trail spot before dawn, and the birds were actually there, and they were gobbling, and he's able to call in the right age, the right sex uh, bird to within 30 yards. If all those things happen, yes, there's one shot, which has been going on for centuries here. So it's not an easy process. No turkey, no shot, one shot per hunter, maybe. Number three, does it justify intervening in this decades-long process because there'll be no more turkeys if we have a turkey hunt. They'll be gone. I love turkeys. No. We all like to look at turkeys and all wildlife. Based on hard data from New York State, a hunt may affect the population of turkeys by an indiscernible 3%. The turkeys are still going to be here. No difference. Plus, uh, that's temporary anyway, because the reason the spring turkey hunt is when it is, is that the breeding, the nesting has already taken place. The turkeys in your yard will still be there. No difference. Uh, next, uh, does it justify intervening in the process because this is an extra added season? There's going to be a lot more hunting now. We can't possibly allow that. Not really. All hunting seasons are reevaluated every single year by the DEC and the scientists there based on populations. And there are additions and deletions every year. That's how the process works. It's gotten a bit messy here because the town has um, inserted itself into this process, but if this goes through, yes, there'll be more turkey uh, op hunting opportunities, but there'll be less other things. There may be a one limit, a one bird limit on goose or something like that. So the process goes on, uh, it comes and goes. It's not unusual, it's been going on for a long time. Finally, uh, the last of the easy ones, uh, we should interv intervene because the turkeys are our savior from ticks. No. Turkeys probably include them in their widely varied foraging diet, although not all the experts agree on this, as I read in, in the East Hampton Star. Uh, although why not? Insects are on the list, not at the top of the list, but they're on a very long list that they eat insects. Fine. Uh, but, so they probably do. Why not? <clears throat> Either way, though, any difference in the tick, the number of ticks out here uh, after a hunt is so vanishingly small as to be completely a non-issue and irrelevant. <clears throat> Finally, the hard one, and I would venture to say the real one, should we intervene and not allow this because of humans and animal ethics? It's a hard one. What is in a wild or domesticated animal's consciousness has been studied and debated for centuries and millennia, actually. It can be very thought-provoking, not just when out hunting, but also when you're fishing with your child, killing a fish, uh, clamming, killing a clam, farming oysters, calling the exterminator, and even trimming your plants. 
Check out the New York Times. This past week, there's a professor who is putting forth that plants have intelligence, language, and make certain noises when you do some things to them. So I don't have the answers to this age-old question, and neither does anyone else. Very serious, though, and what should be and must be of greatest interest to animal ethicists and activists is animal cruelty, experimentation, and massive factory farming in the world. That's the important stuff. 10 billion animals, including 45 million turkeys, are killed, slaughtered in factory farms every year in this country alone. You know, horrifying. And we have rules. Imagine in other countries. So, we are asking the board and the activist community not to instead try to pick off an easy target, which is local guys who humanely, as the law and their conscious, conscience requires, tries to bag his one turkey, which after all that rigmarole, uh, you can be sure gets prepared and served at table. So look at it as one less ring of the cash register for a factory farm when he takes his turkey, and importantly, a measure of respect for fellow community members who have stood up here and told you multiple times when they should be working, and they don't like this process, they've told you how important it is and how they, our fellow citizens, value this part of local culture. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Anyone else in the room wish to address the board at this time? Jason, do we have any callers on the line? Yes, we do. Give me a second and I'll unmute them right now. And hello, caller ending 4221. You're on the air. Thank you, Jason. Good morning. It's Jane Deering at Amagansett. I guess now I would be known as the girl you know and may or may not love. Um, <laughs> I'm just calling in. <laughs> with two with two quick things really about uh, public hearings and agendas. So first is about the public hearing for the important uh, proposed ADU legislation. Um, if I recall correctly, the public hearing accidentally appeared on the agenda of the March 16th regular meeting. Of course, that was, quote, canceled. And on that day, a resolution was adopted for notice of public hearing for April 6th. Um, I looked at your posted April 6th agenda this morning, but I actually do not see the hearing appearing on the agenda for this coming Thursday. So forgive me if I missed something, any changes or re-noticing, but it's not appearing on the agenda. Um, two things, you know, this, it's an important, it's really important okay. legislation. It's also quite detailed. Sorry. Peter? Yes, Jane, um, it, is, it is not scheduled for the 6th. It will be scheduled for the 20th of April. Oh. Okay, um, forgive me, I missed that. You know, I try and keep track of stuff, so that's great. Um, and then just on that, you know, there were so many thoughtful documents presented at the work session, um, and there's a detailed draft resolution. Um, and I know this has come up before, but anything that you can do to make it easier and clearer for the public to access those sort of supporting documents going into the hearing, the better. Um, second, again, maybe something else I kind of blanked out on. I'd like to go back to the proposed adjustments to the invasive species code. This board um, dealt with specifically regarding bamboo. You had that public hearing, I recall, on February 16th. I spoke at it. I submitted to the record, uh, like about a baker's dozen, of suggested additions and clarifications. Um, but I've lost, again, I've lost the plot from there. I do not recall a resolution adopting the new legislation. Um, did that happen and I missed it? Uh, that has not been adopted yet, I don't believe. Okay. No, we haven't. We, we, we so, wanted to take into consideration your comments, Jane, and, and I haven't been able to schedule an internal meeting yet with um, staff. Uh, I so appreciate that. So all I want to do is check myself and also continue to support 
that legislation. It's such an important step in addressing invasive menace of bamboo. Um, and, and also starting to focus more on this concept instead of revegetation that we always focus on, um, like after clearing for construction projects, but actually start to think about regeneration of our lands, native vegetation, ecosystems, dune lands. It's a much bigger topic, but I just wanted to say that as a placeholder um, and bamboo legislation will be a great and important start, start um, but I believe there'll be more to come. So thank you. I wish everyone wonderful holidays in the week ahead. Happy Easter and happy Passover. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Any other callers on the line, Jason? One moment, and we have no other callers on the line. Okay. At this point, we will move forward with our work session agenda topics. And first up, we have Jeannie Carosa, town purchaser. Hello. Good morning. Okay. Um, I have one acceptance. It's for food service and kitchenware items, and that's Mavilla Foods of New York and Sam Tell and Son. Several extensions, supply and delivery of Hino truck parts, Gabrielli truck sales, supply and delivery of international truck parts, Syosset truck sales, and portable toilets, rental and servicing, and that's with Outback Portable Toilets Incorporated. And several notices coming up. Um, Montauk sand replenishment. We have an enforcement search and rescue um, port security vessel for Marine Patrol. Second house restoration phase three. Surplus oyster seed sale. Mobile food concession at Gin Beach. And the an an annual contract for cesspool, grease trap, and tank pumping. And finally, printing of envelopes and business cards. And that's it for now. Any questions for Jeannie? No. no. Thanks, Jeannie. Thank Jeannie. Okay, next up, we have the draft code changes regarding geocubes. And we have Brian Frank, who's our senior environmental planner, here to present. Morning, Brian. Good morning, Mr. Supervisor, board members. Brian Frank, Chief Environmental Analyst in the town's uh, planning department. Um, I, uh, I guess I'll start the uh, out. Thank you. And if Brian, you could just pull the mic a little bit closer. Closer? Yes. To me? Yes. Speak okay. up. Project. And my hearing's not what it used to be. People rarely ask me to speak up. It's usually the other. <laughs> I may change that later. We'll see other presentation. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, anyway, uh, board members, um, I, I'd like to discuss with you um, some changes that uh, the planning department has is suggesting um, in working um, uh, collaborative, collaboratively with the town attorney's office and the principal building inspector on changes to the emergency activity section of uh, the town code. Um, the emergency activity section of the code, which is in uh, it, it's part of zoning, it's uh, chapter 255, uh, section 4-29. Um, was initially adopted in 2007. It was uh, part of a broader uh, coastal legislation that was uh, the last um, requisite necessary for the Department of State to accept the town's uh, local waterfront revitalization plan. So these, uh, these emergency activities were part of a broader um, code revision um, that covered a number of topics. Uh, those regulations also uh, were the, the same legislation that adopted our coastal erosion overlay zone districts and much of the um, natural resource special permit specific standards that were developed specifically for erosion control structures. Um, the code section, I, I know we've been speaking about geocubes in particular, but the code section really pertains to geotextiles. And at the time, uh, geotextiles, uh, the one that was most often envisioned were uh, something called a geotube, which was, is, is often colloquially described as a sand sausage, uh, a cylindrical geotextile fabric that, that's filled with sand that's pumped through in a slurry of sand and water and placed... Um, at the toe of a, of a dune or bluff for erosion control. Um, over time, uh, 
the application of geotextiles has most frequently taken the form of uh, something called a, a, a geo cube. An individual geo cube is a one cubic yard. It's three by three by three. It's filled with sand. Each one weighs, um, I, I, I've seen different numbers. I think it depends on the, on the size of the sand. Um, but about 1,700 pounds each. Um, they're filled with sand. Um, they're stacked and tied together, uh, interconnected uh, to form uh, basically the, uh, the same as a seawall. Um, in the emergency activity sections of the code, a geotextile is the only temporary emergency measure that the code authorizes. Other emergency activities consist of uh, non-structural restoration, the, um, the relocation of the structure that's imperiled uh, from coastal erosion, or allowing the building inspector to authorize uh, emergency repairs to the structure to help shore it up to prevent uh, more serious uh, structural failures. Um, so the geotextile is the only temporary emergency measure um, authorized. Uh, its duration is specifically limited to six months. Um, it does allow for a three month extension and the um, the building permit requirements for a geotextile include a removal plan. So when a, when a person applies for this type of structure, part of those requirements are a submission of a plan that explains how the structure is going to be disassembled and how that uh, natural feature is going to be uh, restored at the end of this duration. So the duration of the permit really shouldn't come as, uh, shouldn't surprise any homeowner, contractor, or agent associated with the structure, they, they really um, have every reason to expect going in uh, the limitation and the temporary nature of this structure. And if you read the enabling legislation of 2007 that authorized the structure, that time frame was developed because of the perception that um, a temporary structure of that nature is <laughs> unlikely to result in a lot of the long-term impacts that are often associated with coastal erosion structures. So it was really intended for an interim, uh, an interim emergency measure to prevent the loss of, of most often a house, a principal structure, um, with the understanding that it has to be removed, restored, and uh, more permanent solutions um, developed um, after that authorization is up. Uh, this is uh, on the screen. This is an example of some of the uh, geo cubes under uh, a, a geo cube seawall under construction. Um, you, you can see that uh, this is not the um, this is not the sandbag that you often see people preparing uh, on the news in advance of a flood, a riverine flood, where you see um, people with wheelbarrows and shovels manually fill, filling sandbags and stacking them up, um, up ahead of uh, rising floodwaters. Uh, these require uh, heavy machinery in the form of cranes and bulldozers, uh, um, bulldozers to fill, uh, help fill them with sand, cranes to lift them and stack them into place here. Um, their, their installation, I, I've observed a, a number of these under construction now. It's, it's a little bit more invasive than simply just placing a sandbag at, at the toe of a dune. It involves excavation. Um, but you, you'll see a little bit more in, a, in another photo. Um, these, these structures have been installed on at least uh, six properties in East Hampton Town. Um, none of the properties have, uh, that have installed these structures have removed the, uh, these, these seawalls at the expiration of their permits. Um, and they've been in place, um, as the board is probably aware, for uh, multiple years in some cases. <laughs> Um, I've, uh, I, I think it, it doesn't really take an environmental professional. If you observe any of these structures in the field, you can see a lot of the same adverse environmental impacts that are often associated with erosion control structures. And as the, this board knows, um, a lot of that 2007 legislation was intended to really <laughs> accentuate the importance of the town's beaches and natural resources and help really um, provide tight controls about when erosion control structures are used because of their adverse impacts. It's, uh, you know, the beaches, it's, it's codified the importance of beaches um, to the town, both economically and, and culturally. 
Um, but it, you can observe these structures in the field and you will see flank erosion at the end of these structures. You will see a loss of public access where at high tide there's a loss of a forced drawer passage along the beach. You can observe uh, beach lowering and a, a general diminution of uh, the coastal habitat that uh, a lot of the town code regulations, uh, natural resource regulations in particular, are intended to um, protect. And uh, aesthetically, that's uh, an exposed um, white plastic wall, uh, essentially. And I think you can see that in the, uh, in the next slide coming up. Uh, so each of, these, uh, each of these bags is three feet tall. Uh, it might be squished down a little bit for uh, weight. So that, that wall that you're taking a look at now is a, a little bit less than six feet above the elevation of the beach. Um, since that photograph, there has been uh, additional beach lowering. That lower course is a little bit more exposed. And, and again, um, I think the impact of these structures uh, over time is is pretty undeniable. It's, it's demonstrable. It's uh, documented. I have a... a ton of photographs from, from some of these properties. Uh, and it's clearly contra contrary to the intent of protecting um, the shoreline with an erosion control structure. There's no real environmental review. There's no long-term mitigation. Um, and and the reason that we're here today is it's, it's become apparent that the code is um, not adequate to ensure that these structures are used in the way that they were intended to use. Um, so just to summarize what some of these code changes uh, do, um, it does give the town more control over how they're installed and um, how they're removed. These code changes really are only going to apply to the uh, any new structures going forward. It doesn't address the existing structures that are out there. That's uh, most effectively a, a separate conversation. Um, it empowers the building inspector to consult with uh, more town officials in assessing whether an erosion, uh, a, a geotextile is necessary. The existing code limits that consultation essentially to the fire marshal or the town engineer. Uh, it allows the building inspector to uh, consult with a, 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 another private engineer other than any engineer that may be associated with the design of the project, again, to assess both the impacts of the structure and the vulnerability of the principal structure in question. Um, it limits the length of the geotextile. If we're going to protect somebody's house in the short term, then the then this structure should be used to protect the house, not necessarily span the entire width of the property. Um, it requires the posting of a security equal to no less than uh, twice the construction cost, and it requires a, a, an access easement which would allow um, the the town, if necessary, entry to the property and remove the structure if, um, if the um, property owner uh, chooses not, not to do so. Um, that's a summary of the code change. I'm happy to address any questions that the board may have, um, either your own questions, anything that you heard from any member of the public today, I, I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, I have some questions and also some comments, um, particularly when you're talking about something that's meant to be a temporary emergency um, structure to to and and the, the importance of those two words. And when you talk about impacts, you've talked about impacts to the town beaches, but. Um, there's also can be potential harmful impacts to the neighboring properties, um, which would be scoured out by the construction of a hard surface. And, and you know, uh, since 2007, we certainly had evidence then, but since that time with sea level rise and the studying of our coastal areas and the impacts of the hard structures that exist, we have definitive proof of the, the negative impacts that can happen, not only to the to the reduction of any beach uh, existing anymore, but also to the impacts to neighbors um, of, of these hard structures. So I, I think it's essential to keep this type of structure temporary and for emergency use only. I think leaving it there for years and years and years will bring very harmful consequences um, to the town beaches, to neighboring properties, and to the 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 areas in town that are most vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, they don't help, they hurt. So uh, I support the uh, town amendments. I hope that we can find ways to um, 
support folks that need the emergency permits to to uh, for their principal structures, but also give us the ability to uh, have them removed and not have the ones that stay there forever. Sandbags don't last forever. It's not the so it's a temporary solution, even by their own design. So for me, leaving their them there in perpetuity is not the answer to any solution for any homeowner. Limiting the length of the structure will help provide a little bit of better protection to the adjoining properties too, by having that structure limited to whatever's necessary to protect uh, the house if we're talking about a residential property. Yeah, I've also seen uh, a better application even of hard structures where it's up against the house foundation uh, rather than where it interacts with the coastal processes, which it will get destroyed anyway. Um, whatever it is, it'll, even hard structures get undermined, uh, can't keep out the water. Um, so I, I think uh, limiting the, the length is also important. The time, the length, it, it's an emergency structure, temporary emergency structure. That's what's in this part of the code. In terms of coastal shore hardening uh, for chronic erosion, say, we have other code sections and review, environmental reviews from our planning uh, department that allow that, but also evaluate the design for effectiveness and for uh, uh, pointing out any uh, unintentional impacts. Correct. All right, can I go to the security and posting of the security? That's going to come off of uh, no less than twice of the construction costs. Who's going to be fighting construction costs? The, the property, the applicant, or is it that get verified by the town also to make sure that the amount that would be secured financially is, is correct for f potential future use if needed? I, I believe the amount would be determined uh, the same way the, um, the, the fee for the building permit is, is determined right now. Um, I don't know uh, that we have a verification process uh, built into that at this time. David, is that like a performance bond? Like for Southwark Wind, they had to supply us with a performance bond before they could start the project? Yeah, in a way, but this would be more of a, of a security uh, than a performance bond. But yes, it, the same action in the end, it would be the same final response would be removal if they've been there too long. Using so that doesn't become the taxpayer's time. responsibility? No. It's, the it's, taxpayers of the town's response. It's on the applicant. So I, I would just like to say that, you know, the intent of the emergency permit for these types of structures was just that, to be a temporary stopgap measure uh, to um, give a property owner an opportunity to uh, secure that principal structure until other plans can be made. And those other plans uh, would include relocation of, of the principal structure landward to be out of harm's way. And many of the reaches that we have within the town, our LWRP doesn't allow for permanent um, coastal structures. And the reason for that is that we live on an island that's constantly eroding, has always been eroding ever since uh, the Ice Age. Um, and, you know, we um, have as our very most precious resource our beaches. This town attracts its whole economy based on the beaches, really, and the free public access to them. And we've seen uh, the diminishment of public access because of these structures along shorelines that are impacted by erosion. Erosion actually is the natural process that provides sediment to the beach. Um, banks eroding, uh, dunes eroding, spreading that sand along and transporting it along the literal littoral drift. When you cut off that supply of sediment by having a coastal structure or a wall, you're retaining it, and the amount of sediment or sand in front of that property gets washed away by the sea action, lowering the beach, causing a situation where we have, even at low tide, no portion of the beach exposed uh, for the general public's use. Um, and I think really what we're faced with is a situation of private property owners 
uh, you know, often spending huge amounts of money to be in close proximity to that beautiful resource, what looks like a benign and benevolent uh, ocean or bay, uh, when we know that it's not such. And um, due to storms and natural processes over time, they're living in imperiled environment. And a lot of people don't realize that at time of purchase. And I think, you know, we need to do a better job as a community to protect that most precious resource. And this is, I think, one step towards doing that. But the broader conversation is really coming down to ensuring public rights of access and protecting that resource over time. And the public benefit has to outweigh the private interests in this if we're going to maintain our beach community. And, and much of what you just said is, is reflected in the town's comprehensive plan the LWRP and, um, and, and the zoning code. This is not a new concept. I'll add, I'll add the, <laughs> but, the CARP plan, which we recently adopted into the uh, comprehensive plan as well. I, uh, and our code should reflect our comprehensive plan. I do also think that the EC has to uh, coordinate better with the town, townships on there. Uh, I know we've heard, heard about the coastal zone management being reviewed and changed. Uh, I think think coastal zone management should be left up to the local governments more than the DEC coming in overriding a lot of times or giving their opinion. So as we go in, as the supervisor was saying, different layers to this approach to protect our resources on there is making sure that the DEC understands that we have a better knowledge of the areas in our local local areas most of the times than they might. And then for they, they should coordinate with us better. It, it's also worth pointing out that the, um, that the state's coastal, coastal erosion hazard area program has a lot of parallel goals to the to the town regulations and and the two regulations should really be kind of whenever possible working together it should be kind of rowing in the same direction so to speak and um should be complementing each other so when was the last time seha maps from the state were updated um to my knowledge they've never been updated mm -hmm. they were adopted um they were drafted and incorporated in the law in, I think, 1988. I think the law calls for them to be updated every 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> 1988. 1988. I was in, I was in elementary so Those are the official CIHA maps, minus any um, individual property uh, map modification, and they've done a number of those over the years. But the state's maps that went out to public hearing, um, that happened in the mid-'80s. With no updates as intended. Correct. In the code. And I just want to say, just Brian, tell us what CIHA is for folks uh, who don't know. Coastal, coastal erosion hazard area. Thank you. And there's you a management that, that, plan. That hazard area is only encroached further inland over time, given erosion. And there is the, the maps, new maps were drafted. Um, I've seen a, a sample of them. There's a, a lot more information in them. There are certainly a lot more streets on them than there were in 1988. Sure. Um, they are orthorectified to work with um, contemporary GIS systems. Um, it, it's not, um, I'm not, I, I can't tell you why uh, um, the update has, hasn't gone farther. So I just wanted to say, Brian, I appreciate you distilling this down for us in this PowerPoint. It's really helpful. I think it's helpful for the community when they go to take a look at it. And I'm supportive of the proposed code changes. I just had a question for Kate. You had, we had discussions. You had some comments about like the actual wording of the code amendments because I'm guessing that this is going to be ready for public hearing shortly. So I don't know if you had any chance to discuss that with. I did. I had a discussion with Brian um, about uh, my suggestions. I didn't bring them up since the amendments weren't in front of us uh, in public session. So, but yeah, there there are some uh, other areas that I think we can just tighten up. Uh, there's some vague um, vague language, as, as is usual for a draft, um, and we can discuss them going further um, in terms of uh, evaluation by which departments, uh, uh, some of the 
the details. Um, just tightening it up so that uh, for me, it's important that uh, the town, the building inspector work with the planning department uh, because that's where uh, our evaluators exist. So when I see something like any department can consult with any department, um, I don't know if that's the best language um, for use. I certainly would like to see the planning department involved. And also, uh, if we're going to, uh, if the, uh, planning and natural resources, I would, I would yeah, agree. To yeah, that. if the building department is going to ask for comments, I think that a memo should be produced um, rather than just having a conversation. I think whatever comments are solicited and written, they should be in writing for the record. Um, it wouldn't take long to write up a memo. Um, and this way, there's something that people can, the public and future evaluators can look at the reasoning behind these decisions. So it might be a good idea to um, take that that draft once we get it tweaked and just do another quick review of that in public session and uh, address it. Does that sound like um, yep. something the board wants to do then? Should we circulate the draft first and get your comments right. back and then bring an amendment? Yeah, we have, it. Yeah, we just, have uh, seen the draft. I, I sent back comments. And Kate sent comments, comments back, back on yeah. March 30th. So you want us I, to incorporate think, all uh, that first from everybody and then bring it back? Or you just, I mean, that's what we'll, we'll post the, the comments to date. Or is, saying, it, by, by is there anybody? Open, if we can go, like, you know, the plan, you know, planning, planning department, National right. Resources Department, uh, engineer or outside engineer professional. Right. Uh, by officials, I'd rather take officials out. On there, I would rather have by departments or their designees. Okay. So let's just uh, take a, take a moment uh, leading up to the next work session and and um, okay. make any further right. just comments or revisions, any... and then right. we'll bring it back for a few changes that through. we seem to have a consensus, and on. we can okay. schedule it for right. hearing. Yeah, I just okay. want to say I've, I agree with everything that's been said here, and I've followed your um, comments too, Kate. Um, and I, I think it's appropriate. I think the time frame is appropriate back to this actual um, piece of legislation. And, I, I, you know, partly I think homeowners need to understand that they do have a time limit and that they can't leave them there forever because it looks as though what's happened is they just leave them there forever. So w they need to have a plan. And this is the only way for them to get to a plan, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever it is that they have to do to secure. Um, we've given them the opportunity that they need to, um, you know, go with, with what the code says. Yeah, and I think it's important also, the longer they stay there and the more deteriorated they become that we're actually, um, we're not actually, but the, it, it gives the homeowner a very false sense of security that these will actually uh, continue to help them over time rather than to seek a more um, permanent solution, whether it be living shoreline or, or whatever. But I, I wouldn't want those homeowners to sit there and think in another impending, um, you know, cat a significant hurricane that oh it's it's still going to protect me i i would hate for them to think that mm, that's a good point yeah and, and that resource in front of the waterfront home in most cases is the public resource it belongs to every one of us right. and we have a right to have that resource in perpetuity and you know that's where the the balance really has to go in favor in my opinion of the public ownership of the land in front of waterfront properties the the shoreline is ephemeral it's constantly changing and um you know we risk sacrificing that public resource for private interests if we don't really take a careful look and ensure through our code and enforcement the protection of that resource So next up, we have so, uh, so, and so just to put a filing. So Brian, we'll look at the language of of the drafts and get me information. Maybe we'll bring it back next week or the week after, just to go over that language again. Yeah, I think just to run through the actual um, code amendment language uh, next work session would be helpful, and then we can schedule for public hearing. If everybody's in agreement that it's yep. ready to go. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, next up is the UR map modification for Glen Valley Associates. John, um, we have, we have Eric, um, Eric, Eric here with the presentation. So. <laughs> yeah, I can. Oh. 
you want to? Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to in a second. Uh, Eric Chance, Assistant Planning Director. I'll, I'll give you a rundown of the um, proposed UR map modifications. Just let me connect the uh, visual here for you. Give me a minute or so, because i got to close out a bunch of stuff here. Okay, so to save some time <clears throat> while I'm loading this up, uh, Glen Valley is an application to modify the UR map. Um, I can give you the exact number in a second of that map. It's a property up in Northwest. Um, basically, there's an application in, in front of the planning board for a subdivision to divide the parcel into two lots. It has the requisite yield under um, the zoning code for two lots. And hopefully now you can see <clears throat> an aerial on GIS. Um, I can zoom way out here to show you where this location is. Uh, that's one of the uh, original lots there. Um, so you can see that to the north and west of the school there. Um, I will zoom in further so you can see the subject parcels, um, which are numerous individual tax map parcels. I will try to clarify this for you by sorry, clicking on all of them. As you'll see as I click on these, it's a bunch of little pieces of uh, individual tax map parcels. And basically under the existing UR map, uh, which once I'm done here, um, so you can see the area there, um, this is zoned A residence. They're proposing to divide um, what is currently one UR parcel uh, into two. Both are, again, are the requisite lot area. I believe one is about 59,000 square feet, one's about 48,000 square feet. This is the existing UR map. So um, just jumping back real quick to the aerial, just to show you the property on the northwest corner here is an individual and separate um, parcel under the UR map. This parcel, which is all these little pieces that you see here, is parcel number 60 under the UR map. Um, so again, you can see that parcel that's not included is, is in gray. The remainder of that area is this one parcel. And then the applicants are proposing essentially to divide it into two parcels. Again, this has been in front of the planning board uh, for preliminary subdivision. Um, normally, um, many of the town board members are aware that normally with a two lot subdivision, a lot of times it's handled as a sub waiver or minor subdivision. In this case, since the properties are within the water recharge overlay district, they have to be handled as an open space subdivision. You can see a reserve has been drawn on the southern portion of the property, um, which is where there's a small area of steep slopes. It also provides a buffer. That's a 25% reserved area, which meets the code requirement of open space. Um, there were some comments received on this where originally that was listed as a scenic easement. It is required to be a reserved area. Again, this is going through the formal subdivision process in front of the planning board. So uh, it will go for final subdivision approval. Uh, during that process, we'll clarify all the map notations, um, clarify locations of easements, cl clarify that the reserved area should be dedicated to the town. Um, that kind of standard, you know, bookkeeping and, and clean up stuff that's done during the final subdivision process. So um, again, uh, these properties have the requisite lot area. The planning board has granted preliminary approval. The planning department has no objection to the modification as it's shown in front of you. And Eric, that southerly uh, reserve area that is 50 feet wide? Um, well, the the less than? mention was about a, a um, easement along Old Northwest Road, which would be on the left-hand side of the property. Right. Um, that's required. So to, that'll to be, be in buffer. place. And yeah, there that's is, It looks like there is a small line there. Is that the word? That's, a, that's um, actually parcel lines. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, roughly that that idea. But that buffer will be incorporated into the reserved area. So I know there was public comment on that earlier. Just wanted yep. to make sure. How, how deep is that, that out parcel lot? Do you have a rough idea of how deep? Which, this one? Yeah. Um, I don't know, but I can tell you. I guess just because based on the 50 foot easement, I think it's probably yeah, it takes up a large portion of that property. Right, a big part of it, but I think there's still a 
<laughs> yeah, and again, um, so yeah, about fifty percent of it. Okay. It's probably about a hundred feet deep. Okay. okay. Um, and again, that that parcel is not actually included in this proposal. It's a uh, separate parcel, as you can see there. It's parcel sixty-one. This is parcel sixty, proposed to be divided into sixty A and sixty B. Eric, can you let me know what's the size of parcel fifty-nine? Parcel, well, okay, sure. Um, it's, <laughs> well, it's a little tricky because it's three individual tax map pieces. Or, oh, nope, they have been yeah, it shows up as so one. I could tell you right away, easily. It is just over 20,000 square feet. So it's a, ha so it's a half yeah, acre. Right. Yes. Roughly, yeah. yeah. And, the, and the one south of it that's vacant, is that combined? I think that was parcel 62 and three on the plot. Uh, which... On the on this one, sixty-two, bottom left corner. Oh, okay. And sixty-four. Is that what you? Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Okay. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Oh, it doesn't look like they've been combined as required. Let me just go back to the math. For six <laughs> well, they're roughly twenty-two thousand square feet and 21,000 square feet. So uh, a lot of these lots in this area are um, similar to the B residence minimum zoning. Again, though, the lots of the subject UR map are proposed to meet the A residence uh, zoning requirement, which is a 40,000 square foot minimum. So, so could I take that back? So options right now is, is that it's one lot, is that yep. correct? And one lot, you'd be able to build to the GFA there. And now, if not, it's going to be two houses, approximately 5,600 square feet. Um, Ish. Yeah, tough to do the math off the top of my yeah, head. It was 1.2, 1.3 acres. In, in doing this, is there any mitigation potentially to, to cap the maximal GFA of the lots? It's a consideration that you could have. It's not something that the planning board discussed, um, just basically because they meet the minimum lot area. But yeah, um, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but because the house size has both a percentage and an allotment by lot of 1,600 square feet plus a percentage, if you divide this into two lots, then in theory, the net you know, um, amount of total gross floor area would increase by 1,600 square feet. So it's a consideration. I'm so sorry. Can you repeat that? I sure. apologize. Um, well, it, right, you know, when you're calculating the allowable GFA yeah. for a residence on any individual parcel, there's a, a raw number allotment, 1,600 square feet, plus a percentage based on lot area. So uh, if you have one lot, it's that it's one, you know, 1,600 allotment. If you have two, you have 1,600 and 1,600, then a percentage based on that aggregate lot area. So once you go from one lot to two lots, you're, you know, if the lot area is not altering, Correct. then you are. The reserve area would be taken out of that first the reserved lot. Reserved area would be, yeah. Yeah. Well, well it, it wouldn't be taken out of the first lot. It wouldn't lot. be taken out of the first lot because that it's not a could requirement. Be higher based on yeah. the, the square yeah. footage. Okay. Yeah. And the reserved area requirement is 25%. So it probably works out evenly, but I did not crunch those numbers at a time. So my, my, I, I know the last note on here is that, and then the, re the request right here right now is, is the recommendations is that um, they don't want the, the town board to make a decision on this yet. Um, no, the um, the idea was basically that um, the the yes and no, the planning board at least was holding off, um, is going to hold off on the final until the town board makes the decision on the, on the, um, you are map modification that we were discussing a little bit of the procedure here because um, there was a question as to whether or not the applicant should come to you first for the um, before they get preliminary subdivision approval from the planning board but they now have the preliminary subdivision approval that's um, that makes sense because the planning board really has purview over lot layout and things like that um, again that is not anticipated to change substantively um, so basically the idea would be that you, with any conditions or, you know, approve or deny the UR map modification, then the applicants would come back for the final subdivision, which really is mostly notations and clarifying, you know, where the, who the reserved area is going to be dedicated to almost certainly the town. 
um, you know, those cleanup elements. So yes, you can render a decision. And water now. recharge over, what, this is water recharge overlay. So the clearing is restricted to that's correct. how yeah. much? Uh, again, don't have a percentage. Of, I'm sorry. It's a percentage, correct? Yes. It, yeah. So uh, what I'm trying to get to is, is there's a known entity could be one large lot, one large house based on that. Yep. That would have maybe more buffering, maybe some more clearing, but a known entity of one structure. Correct. How does that change the character of the community there now with two structures, two, two clearing and two separate envelopes instead of one envelope? And that's what I'm trying to get to a little bit. Yeah, well, I, I think if you look at the aerial, you'll get an idea as to the nature of the neighborhood. And, and actually, I think the lots to the north are either comparable or maybe slightly even smaller than what's being proposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the, uh, as you were asking about surrounding lots, most of the lots in this neighborhood are in the vicinity of a half an acre, whereas one acre zoning is the minimum. So, you know, we've talked about it, it having frontage on nor old Northwest road, but it's also got quite a bit of frontage on Mulford Avenue for those who are familiar with Mulford Avenue. Yeah. But I, I mean, from my look at it, I, I don't think it's inconsistent with the, with the neighborhood. Um, in terms of lot size, um, and, and you know, generally, I don't have any objection to altering the map here. So I just have a couple of questions, Eric. So, um, so the fifty-foot easement off of Old Northwest Road. Mm -hmm. um, they're now proposing that to be in a reserved area. Correct. And they so it a little bit in my head, it's like double dipping. Yeah, uh, um, that, that was something that came up um, and really sort of in the opposite direction of the, the town, at least as far as the open space requirement, you can't double dip on the applicant. Right. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like, uh, are, are they double dipping by getting, you know, their reserved area and the easement? But I think it actually goes the other way where the easement requirement, first of all, is an easement that hasn't been filed yet. Okay. So the one lot is being subdivided and then getting the reserve area <laughs> requirement. But the easement itself is intended as illustrated, you know, as noted in the UR map as a buffer for Old Northwest Road. It's meant to be a visual buffer. Um, so basically, when we talked about this in the, in the early stages of the preliminary subdivision application, you can't require the easement, remove it from their lot area, and then make them do the other 25%. As long as they're incorporating that buffer within the required open space allotment, it doesn't matter if it's easement, reserved area, um, that's how the map gets drawn. So, in this case, though, the intention is to have the entirety of that area be a reserved area, which okay, would be dedicated so the, to the, the town. The hockey stick portion, yeah. I guess I would call it. Um, how wide is that? That seems pretty narrow. Sure. Um, I can tell you if I scale out the map here. <laughs> and then is Bar to add on to that, is Barnes yeah, Road, Barnes yeah. uh, Avenue, is that a... This property. Yeah, the idea here. Roadway. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, the idea here was to, and also, I guess, um, so I believe the width of that is about 30 feet, uh, give or take. I don't, I don't know exactly, but if you look at the aerial here, you'll see, obviously, um, where is this again, Mul uh, Mulford. Mulford is the road to the right. north. So, you know, if you're looking at where you're going to put the, the buffer here in the reserved area, it made the most sense to have, you know, there's this portion of right of way that the applicant or the owners of this lot could uh, claim to the halfway point of the right of way here, which keep that in mind. That'll come up in the next conversation. Yeah, that um, should come up in this yeah. one too. Well, it, it, and these neighbors um, here to the south have already claimed their halfway portion. So the idea here was it didn't really make sense to have a buffer along the road for obvious reasons. The really the question here was whether or not to have it over here. But again, you have Woodlot Lane, um, you know, uh, and that could be abandoned as well to the center line, could it not? No, no, no. That's Wood improved. Line, that's improved. Oh, it is. Yeah. So this is the only area that doesn't really abandoned. show up as being open on the. So, so the I just area. wanted so they could we could or right now it's the map reads there's a reserved area and then they could. <laughs> abandoned to the center part, which doesn't that fragment what we've just done. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me at all. Either. Yeah, it's it's a yeah. good point. And to be honest with you, it's it's something I hadn't uh, considered in this duly noted. Okay. And I, I think uh, as the um, 
uh, when we get to the final, that, that's something to consider. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's a very good point. I see exactly what you mean is that, you know, if along this turquoise line here, yeah. your reserved area comes along here and then they can <laughs> claim that portion. I mean, obviously there's not much they can oh. do with it. But no, we it'll should, become part of their property we should be, yeah, and, but, and yeah. lawn and no, in no short order. Yeah, and there's so, an electric easement running through there as well. So can that be cleared for the uh, utility to access I, through our reserve? That's a good question. Um, oh, the yeah, if, we, area. if we get the reserved area, we there's would already the an electric line. easement running through yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, zoom in on the survey here. And the other side of it is they could abandon it now and use that towards their calculations too, which is probably something we'd but rather who, do. But who has the that. electric easement? It looks who like it's that? for the uh, for the whole entire subdivision because of how it goes all the way back towards Barnes. Yes. Yeah, there is an electrical easement. Um, that's another great point. I have to look into what exactly that says. Um, uh, I would assume that you're permitted to trench and not leave clearing, but I'll look into that um, because, yes, that would be through the reserve. I do see as it's drawn here, though, they did incorporate the portion that's to be abandoned into the reserved area. Um, so you wouldn't have that little strip in between because it is part of the reserved area. But yeah, um, that's something would to look that be into. Would a requirement that they that make it a requirement that they abandon the road and incorporate yes, it? Yes, of course. The... Yep. Okay. So the I, other I thing I might consider, that. though, is instead of this long flagpole hockey stick looking, that the reserve needs to, you know, I would have incorporated lot fifty three. Uh, you know, the little parcel, lot 53. Um, it needs, I mean, this is an, such an odd reserve area. There's really not a, a nice woodland square or piece. I can incorporate mm -hmm. that and make these lots. I mean, they can still get a, we can get a bigger reserve area and they can still meet the requirement of one acre. Sure. <laughs> so they could Let's move see. the center line over um, what's dividing lots. No, I, I see exactly what okay, you're talking about. It. In, in, in essence, instead of having this little strip, use that area. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Out here. Uh, yeah. exactly. Um, that was discussed by the planning board. They opted to go with this because they felt it provided a buffer to the residential neighbors to the south. But it's certainly it's certainly a good point. Why, why would we abandon it and then just put it into reserve? I'm sorry. Why would we? Why would we authorize the abandonment of the road if we're just going to take it back anyway? They're, they're allowed to do it as a matter of right. It's just really the fact that they haven't done it yet. But yeah. they could have, you know, they could have went yeah. on Monday and abandon and claim their abandonment as a matter of right with the assessors, and then come in Tuesday for a subdivision. So, I think something they already have as far as land as a matter of right under the UR map. They think they should complete that before they go in. Yeah. So in, in at the planning board level, I should also, because we're going to look at it in the next one, at an access point for lot yep. 60A yep. to make sure that that's clear. Sure. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a typo on the map, although, um, well, it's actually not even really, as since this is something that's come up a lot lately with uh, UR map modifications, uh, the standard notation that we have on our UR maps is a little bit confusing as far as that dot. Um, first of all, this is somewhat of an open-ended discussion that John and I have had of, so if you look at 60B right now and where that dot is, yeah. does that mean the driveway has to come in at, in at exactly that location? Um, that's somewhat of an open question. Historically not. I yeah, mean, yeah. And, I, and I, I don't believe so. But yeah. the reason that, and this does actually match the standard sort of way that the, the access points are drawn, the reason you have one on 60B mm -hmm. and not on 60A. Because it was a one lot at one time. Or, well, no, it's no. because 60A is entirely, um, <laughs> only has one road frontage. Uh, uh, so really the dot indicates the which road. road? Uh, I got gotcha. you. to be the access point. Okay. So if you look here, you have um, that, it was called wooded lot land on the aerial. This would now be a corner lot. So okay. the dot denotes that the access should be off this road, not, not this that road. road. Okay. So it's a little, yeah, you, you look at each lot and you look for the dot and see where the access is. But since 60A only has one choice, right. it's not standard to to put that dot there. Got it. And it does look like clearing setbacks would be 40 up to close closer to 50 feet as far as clearing clearing setbacks. But their clearing line on this proposal that you showed earlier in some areas, particularly on Woodalot Lane, might be closer to 60, 65 feet. On the 
Sounds about right. Yeah. So uh, as far as um, and not to you know um, jump the gun here in the board's discussion, but if you do want to see a reconfiguration of the reserved area there, that is something that the planning board is going to have to reconsider. Um, you know, have a discussion about again, and then probably hold an, uh, you know another public hearing, which isn't the end of the world. Um, but basically, you know, um, go back through sort of the preliminary map drawing layout. Uh, but that is your right as the town board being, you know, the applicants needing your approval for this UR map modification. So I just flagged that as, you know, all the other comments we've heard so far are all things that could be incorporated into a final subdivision approval. But that's something you should really decide on because that um, that has a, a much more profound effect on the process. What's the board's pleasure here? We generally supportive of the. Modification, map modification. Are there specific <laughs> caveats? Do we want the planning board to look at this again, or are we com comfortable with it? I mean, I'd like the planning board to look at the reserved area and make it one block instead of this long, 20 foot wide, soon to be incorporated into each um, property and, and make it really meaningful. I don't think this is meaningful. As so a you have, area. yeah, with the abandonment though, doesn't that make the buffer that much wider? It's like half the roadway. No, it doesn't make it. Yeah, it might make it another. Eric, what's the only... what's the unopened portion of the road width there? Uh, Minimally, it's I believe it's 25, but I would look yeah. 25. So it's so you'll have it was 50 feet. and it was 20 uh, actually. It's 20. It's a 40 foot road. So 20 plus 25, so you're what 45 feet, right? And you have a 50 foot scenic easement on the roadway, uh, nor on or old northwest. So basically, you have nearly 50 feet on two sides of the property, yes. Yeah. I, and and that was that, the intention of the planning board, was yeah. To I mean, both I, sides. I don't know, I support that layout, I think. You know, again, those lots are larger than the neighboring lots in the neighborhood. They, they're they going to have a buffer from the road, buffer from properties to the south. And and also with now with also the new policy as far as clearing, it has to be marked out and it, on surveys. And it's, yeah, and it's water recharge, to... so there's going to be additional clearing limitations on them as well. Has the town ever uh, requested uh, a cap on GFA? Um, on, on certain subdivisions, this isn't one where they normally would. You know, if there if there was um, an existing aesthetic in the area, or you know, historic resources or aesthetic resources that warranted limiting buildings to a certain size, then that's certainly something that's often incorporated into covenants and restrictions or other you know conditions. But I mean, um, I'm talking about specific natural feature here, so it's that you try and draw the nexus. It's Right. You know, if you want to address GFA, we should probably do that I comprehensively that, and not yeah. do it on a lot by lot, you know, on a lot by lot basis. And I agree we should take a look at the dimensional tables overall rather than. But I think that's a separate conversation. Yeah. And rather than imposing something just on this particular lot. I agree. So I, I'm generally supportive of what the, you know, the memo that the planning board wrote to us and. Um, could support approving the application. I would also. Okay, so it seems like we have a consensus on that. So we'll we'll um, set this for a public hearing for your mod. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And that brings us up to the next UR map modification, which is 59 Gardner's Avenue. Sure. Um, just give me a chance to get up these. Uh, Visuals for you. Um, Davis, so, moving up. <laughs> so this one is a bit more complicated, and this is a property over in Springs. Uh, the garage place for you. Yeah. Mm. We'll find that considering where the designated access was. I just want to, before I start going into the particulars here, show you where this is located with a sort of a wide shot. So, okay. Well, Battling 
technologies. Can you sign my papers? <laughs> Let me see here. So hopefully you can see the aerial. Again, I'm zoomed pretty far out here, but this is the subject parcel. Uh, this request does not involve a subdivision uh, or any redrawing of property boundaries. It's at its at face value, merely a request to relocate the required access point on this parcel. And I will zoom in a little bit here on the aerial. And when I do, you will see that construction has begun on this property of a single family residence. There's also a swimming pool uh, that is being constructed that you can't see on this aerial just because it's from, um, I believe, March of last year and that, that happened subsequent. So basically, and to make things further a little confusing here, um, the request is to relocate the required access point from gardeners to gardeners. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean by that is- So basically we don't need to do anything. <laughs> Move on. Um, so I'll show you the, the existing UR map right now, but Gardner's Lane is improved uh, and then comes around here. This is all um, uh, um, asphalt. Uh, that hits obviously the, the southeast corner of this lot. And then up to the northwest, there's also Gardner's Lane that comes around down here on this corner. Uh, the applicants are requesting that the access point be moved from the southeast corner to the northwest corner. You can see on the aerial here that this is the garage of the home. Um, so basically the home was, the foundation was laid um, with, the, with access to come from the northwest. So basically their proposal though, as you can see here in construction vehicles, you can see on the aerial have already use this as an access point and clear it in these areas. Um, their proposal is to modify the access where they would have to come in this direction. Obviously, as you can see, and it has partially been done, the clearing has happened. This would necessitate additional clearing as opposed to just taking access from this corner here that hits existing asphalt. And further complicating and exacerbating the problem of that additional clearing, which both the planning department and the planning board um, do not look upon, well, view that as a certainly an undesirable aspect of this request, that additional clearing. This parcel here, it was not purchased with CPF, but it is a town recreational open space uh, parcel. And then this sort of island median here that was drawn in the right of way uh, in the original old filed map is also owned by the town. So, and then you have these road right of ways here where, again, I'll show you on the UR map, um, the surrounding property on all these right of ways that exist here on these sides, on both sides of these are to be abandoned to the midway point, And then any adjoining property owner can, can claim that portion. Um, so basically on this, although Gardner's is improved over here. So basically all this woods you see here to the halfway point this property owner, which is us, the town, has right to claim that uh, all the way down to here. And then again, over on this side, the town is the property owner. So technically the town could claim this portion that I'm highlighting here. Um, obviously there's not much reason to do it. We already own it. Um, but just keep that in mind when you look at um, the areas that could be abandoned because that does come into play with this request um, because the applicants technically could claim to the halfway portion along the west and the south of this property. Um, they have not done so. They have done so. Um, so uh, that happened just recently, apparently. Um, but basically, uh, the planning board uh, discussed this. The planning department flagged the fact that, um, in, you know, changing that access point. First of all, there doesn't seem to be any practical reason to do so. Um, the access point as it's drawn now is the closest location to an improved road. There's certainly downsides to it, namely the addition of clearing uh, that would need to occur uh, in order to run a road a, a longer distance. It also, even though this isn't one big contiguous tract of, you know, nature preserve or any, you know, um, specially designated town open space. It is in effect that area of green and then the, the area of woods um, to the west of the parcel does serve as a contiguous tract of town owned open space uh, that the town has no intention of opening uh, for any reason. So it 
acts as you know a wooded area in this densely populated area of springs um, so bisecting it with the road is not viewed as favorable additionally uh, although it is somewhat in question um, between records that the applicant submitted records that the planning department was able to find and records submitted by the public um, the property was issued a building permit to construct a residence in the general configuration that it has now that was followed shortly thereafter by stop stop work orders um, to, because it was discovered that um, the access point is supposed to come from the southeast. Uh, so, so can we just talk about that sure. last point for just a moment? So they submitted a plan that showed access as they've constructed it, and they were issued a building permit That's based on that, and they began construction. That's my understanding. And adding to that, you have street names, which are the same. Yes. Even though they're yes. seemingly different roads. And, and it, it should be mentioned, too, you know, I, I don't mean to... You know, that is, those are the facts as I understand it, at least as far as the issuing of the building permit. But there is also a responsibility of the property owner uh, to, to look at the UR map before they submit, before they design a new home on the property, submit a building permit application. Um, they did file an application for a road, a road assignment, road improvement, which is standard for a UR parcel. Um, so, you know, I, again, I'm not trying to point fingers of what happened, but um, you know, it, there's due diligence on, on both sides of this to look at the right. UR map and see. So the, uh, the, the impact is. at this point is the, the house is completely constructed or is it not completely constructed? But obviously, as you can see, so if they were to, um, use the suggested or the current map access point, they would have to have an interior driveway, which would clear a major portion of the property in order to reach the garage, right? Yes. Um, it's basically the, the length of the property through the septic field or adjacent to the septic field Yeah, to get there, to their... There is room. Um, so first of all, I mean, I, I guess you could say they... They've also begun constructing a swimming pool over in this corner yeah. of the property. Of course. Um, that being said, there, so there's sort of two ways to look at this. First of all, okay, yes, they have the garage here, but they can just not use the garage or convert it into something else, and they could maintain access from here and, and put a, a driveway and park their cars over here. I understand why they wouldn't want to do that. Um, this is misleading here where you see the, the um, foundation of the building in comparison to the property lines. They're not exact. The property lines are actually a little bit more to, to the front here. Yeah, it so, shows up better on the survey. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, the sanitary field is essentially in the backyard here. There is enough room. The road could come all the way around the, the backyard through here. There's also, I believe, I calculated about 20 feet of clearance from um, or 25 feet from the front property line to the front of the foundation. So they could just come in along the front here. In front of the house. And I understand why they don't want to do that. But also Parking keep in, in mind front of the that, house. that is not accounting for the it's fact good. that the um, right of way can and uh, apparently mm -hmm. has um, recently been claimed uh, in front there, that gives them more room to yeah. put a driveway in the front. So <sighs> it's not as though there is no actual practical physical recourse to get a driveway to the home. And what I want to show you here, I just want to quickly show you the uh, existing and proposed UR map. So um, basically, the parcel here is number 27. Um, again, as I showed you, 26 is owned by the town. 27A is owned by the town, as clearly illustrated here. And then um, basically the, um, although I'm showing kind of the wrong thing here, the wrong existing, um, but uh, basically the idea is to come down, this is what they're requesting. And this is an older version, I apologize. I'll, I'll clarify that. I don't mean to make this any more confusing than it is. <laughs> But the idea would be to come in here and then have their access point be here as opposed to this this point here. But again, all the hash mark you see here, so essentially all the hash marking uh, along here and then up to the middle portion, the, the applicant has the right to claim, um, you know, as a matter of right under the UR map. And it sounds like they have done that recently. Um, but OK, so. That was the, the previous uh, so, UR map. So I'm sorry, let's just go back yeah, to yeah, that I'm point sorry. for a moment. So. This so the existing, except so you, that you say that they've recently claimed 
that southerly portion of Gardner's Lane. Well, I just heard that in the audience uh, oh, okay. today, but all right. Well, let's they have a let's, right to let's assume that yeah. they they have a right to it, so they've done that, yep. and that that would extend all the way up the whole west side of the property, right? West and south, as you see okay. here, you can see that parcel. Well, it's marked by a twenty nine right. just to the south here. They have claimed their halfway. Portion so essentially, if we're looking at this survey, mm -hmm. they could. They could put the driveway coming in off the improved portion of Gardner's Lane mm -hmm. along the southerly border and up the westerly border no, right. to gain yeah. access to the right. map's right. original Absolutely. location yeah. without without dealing with additional clearing within the existing property, correct? Um, other than the clearing for their driveway, um, but well, there wouldn't be, be within the existing property. Yes. property. It would yes, be in the exactly. unopened yeah. roadway. Yes, they wouldn't. Be, they wouldn't the abandoned need to clear roadway portions of the town right of way or claim them or even request this UR map modification from you. But they they've cleared the town's portions of the right of way. Practically the entire thing. Yeah. Yes. Already, um, and they're, they're asking. So they're asking for uh, the town to abandon our portion of twenty six. Yeah, yes. to and give it to them. Yes, and portion of we could sell it to them. <laughs> so I, I'm going to be pretty short with this. I'm not up for that. I think yeah. they should go off the southern area of Gardner's yeah. Lane. Yeah, I also think within their abandonment that th there's a historical use for trail system in there. I know it's mentioned in the letter. We should continue to have that trail system for individuals connect through, from Gardner's Lane up into the town areas. I think having that wooded, wooded block is important there, and there's alternatives for them to use as the UR map as intended. That's yeah. That's you know, I, I, I would be generally more supportive of that, but I, I, the problem I have with this particular situation is that we issued a building permit based on what they submitted, and that's unfortunate. And I think we bear some responsibility there. And, you know, I, I, you know, you can say that there's responsibility on both sides, but I think that's really on us. Well, building permits can be, can, you know, be issued an error. And so can right. yes, they, yes, they can. But I mean, I think you have to give some deference because an applicant relies upon the town to say things are okay or not okay. Well, they can still access their property. But they now go through. Well, they've made, but they made. Let me just. Cut, I'm sorry. No, so, they, but they access it at the northwestern side by 11, if if they've already claimed that road instead of going over the town's property. Because yeah, they've cleared all the way over across the road. Yeah, I don't. So there's another so, option. So I don't see a deference. Off the southern side, yeah. correct? Loop through their abandoned portion of the roadway up the west side under their abandoned and don't change the. They have yeah, and and and, and change the entrance point. Don't just look at that. Well, if they wanted to, because it would be, it, it would, it, there, what's unique about this is that they have two front yards that they're abandoning. They have two, two, two yards that they can abandon. That, that's very unique. You don't get that in many other locations. So they're actually adding thousands of linear, thousands of square feet to the property just as of right, which is it, at times we've actually said no, no to that anymore. Um, I think they can access their property through what they have as of right. Well, how, okay. They just have to loop around more. I also think that if the driveway what? is on the, are we calling it the uh, the southern side, the abandoned port, it's going right by the front door. That makes a lot of sense to me. Why wouldn't a driveway go right by the front door? Along the entire front where of is the, the house? Where is the front of the house? It's a little black, black dot on the left western side. Got it. So the house faces west and the driveway is going to come across across uh, front the front of the property yep. and uh so they're, they're actually going to take their access onto the property like that without but, but i guess this is the this is the part i'm having trouble with they'd actually would have to go off the abandoned roadway into the property mm -hmm. for a portion of the driveway and then they could come back out onto the abandoned like on the blue hash that, that's Correct. that's what i'm saying but they have to enter. They have to actually have some entrance into that southerly portion of the property. Would they still need one? Well, they would have to. They would have to have the driveway fully on the southern portion outside of the crosshatched area of the abandonment. No. Not necessarily. No. Why? Yeah. Because that now becomes 
expanded and it's now prior to the property. Been abandoned. Yeah. Yep. Essentially, where you see the blue hash yeah, is I their property. Okay. I mean, I'm okay with that. Is okay. right. They can yeah. enter and get to their garage. That's right. I, I'm okay with that and revegetating what, what they've already cleared. Yeah. And so let me. Um, I just want to clarify one thing here. So basically, you know, the the planning department's position on this was just that. Um, you know, as, as, as far as the function of locating the access within a UR map, um, we didn't really see any reason, um, you know, other than the unfortunate circumstances that happen of, of the, the building permit being issued. If you just look at it as a blank slate, there's really not much of a reason here to modify the access. It's not like it makes more sense if you were starting with a blank slate to, to put it up to the Northwest. It makes more sense in the Southeast as it's currently drawn. And also, as we cautioned the planning board, it's not a very good precedent to set to start amending UR maps to, to correct errors that, that happened at some point. That being said, um, I just want to illustrate this because this went along with the memorandum that you received from the planning board. The planning board um, discussed this and they were trying to think of, because um, really the, the main issue here, the big problem that they saw was that increased clearing and that needed for that new driveway that would come, as you can see, with those arrows there and then coming then down, heading south along the western portion of the property. Um, the blue hash mark that is noted there is meant to illustrate the portion of the right of way that the applicants can claim as a matter of right. The planning board essentially noted that that's um, somewhat of you know an equal amount of area there. So basically, um, the letter that they sent you is was basically if the applicants agree to um, you know if you allow the applicants to take this L shaped portion for their access, but then this portion that they're entitled to as a matter of right. If they preserve that in perpetuity, um, if they revegetate it as needed, because there is clearing that occurred in that area. And then also, I think most importantly, um, showing you on the aerial, uh, this is not a part, this is not a recognized trail and not a part of an established trail system, but there is somewhat of an uh, established footpath um, that does exist in this area and bike path that, that essentially connects that um, those two portions of gardeners. If that's maintained, if there's some form of, you know, if all these things are somehow maintained in perpetuity, then it, it makes sense because, you know, essentially right now, if you, I mean, obviously this isn't a huge distance here, but if you did want to maintain this as a pedestrian link between the roads, the applicants are allowed as a matter of right to block this off completely to gardeners. So, if you if there was some agreement here where this would be left in its natural state and this trail link was preserved so that it could um so why why board was only <laughs> supportive of the request if those conditions were so, met. so so if you're talking there, about so yeah it, it just to talk about that they as of right can abandon that southerly and lower westerly portion correct they've yep. currently okay. wanted to use the upper northerly and easterly side of the town property if um, if we ask them to abandon and convey to the town that portion that way it, it remains you know preserved that access for trail or whatever could remain preserved Yep, and, and that was the you wouldn't have board. to do additional clearing. I mean, there's some to be said for not doing additional. Clearing. So then you're saying we'd be whole. Yeah, I think we'd be whole then because you're taking maybe it's maybe even a little bit more distance wise in area. If you took the uh, you know portion they could legally abandon and convey that to the town in exchange for giving them that access right. over the northerly portion. But then we have to check if they already took the abandonment. On that section, well, yes, we they can could check still it. condition that. Well, they one. could, but if they've abandoned it to their property, they could still convey it to the town. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I mean, you'd, you'd reduce the overall clearing. But you don't also have fragmented a, a woodland. You put a driveway right through the middle. It's of It's already it. there. It's not well. <laughs> they, that's wasn't. how they built the house. They've been accessing that portion. It's already cleared. No. Well, there's a the whole section that hasn't been cleared, which is what they. It, would, it is yeah. actually cleared. It, it is. doesn't show up on yeah because that's how they're getting in to do all the construction. Did you the go back to the area yeah, all the way going up that way? Because I have a question on what kind of road that is that comes off the northerly portion. 
what is that? Is that just pavement? Is that dirt? Looks like dirt. Yeah. That's just a dirt access, and that will re will that now be paved? <laughs> if we if we do the northerly suggested route, uh -huh. what happens to the portion between the actual improved road and the air? Their property. That would be their their driveway. Yeah. Under that scenario where they convey the unopened, abandoned, and unopened portion to the south and west, then that just becomes their driveway. And what they would access, which is what it would be coming off the other way if we didn't do anything. Yeah. Right. Well, essentially, right now, um, and I I tried to this came on your agenda pretty quickly. I was trying to get an. Uh, um, um, overlay of the aerial on the proposed um, UR map, and I'm sorry I don't have that for you, so I keep switching back and forth. But essentially, right now, um, when slash now that they have claimed their the portion of the right of way that they're allowed to, um, they could you know without your UR map modification, they could snake a driveway in you know essentially uh, around this way, and then basically they already have begun as you can see on the aerial <coughs> during construction using that as their access. This is clear for the most part here, um, but that's what they're requesting is to keep that in perpetuity. Was that previously cleared before the construction, that upper crescent part? No. Not, not the side part, but further up that attaches yeah, to garden? Yeah, right there. I don't believe so, no. I can show you the over area. Their construction took over a large footprint. It really did. It's really unfortunate. So that's a 2020 aerial. Wow. Hold on a second. Wow. Just, yeah. Wow. That's really so unfortunate. Right at the, yeah. Yeah. You can see there's a little bit of like a turnaround there. Yep. Yeah. But no, for the most part, the answer is And no. then go back to the present. So you could reduce any further clearing. You could well, yeah. have them have a driveway width of that unopened road in the town keep the other portion and any disturbance revegetated by them. So can I just one point what Peter's sort of getting to here, can, alluding to, can, if you see the black trail that's on there right now, can you go back to the last photo that you had also, please? Yeah. You got to see, in, can you notice where the trail is there? No, I can't. I can't okay, the trail is the bottom south corner of the white, of the, of the blue going in there. I mean, so, it, so it which looks like it might run through here. Yeah. Get down exactly, and that's still on their the current plan. So the users of this area, which is heavily used with families and kids, they they've just moved their trail. So can you go to the next one? What well, is as as is right now? You see how the bottom right was there. The house went in. People are still using it, or whoever's using it, and just so there's an active group of individuals that try are trying to connect these two little neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So, well, you could, uh, you you know, could ensure that by taking that southerly portion. That's why I think maybe the best solution here is to prevent any further clearing and do a swap or at least give them an easement over the for a driveway, just a driveway easement over that northern portion, retain of a specific and, width without the width width and one. retain the rest and maybe in could amend the UR map. So have them this, this easterly part to be an axe uh, to be not abandoned, you know, and it'll be open as a driveway access. That's what we typically do in the U.S. Well, you could, but you could hold it. It's actually a full road width, right? And we own both it is, sides. It is, but we own, so, so we, we went, could, we could push it to the most advantageous side. Right. right. Which, which is maybe the, yeah, you know, but, towards I mean, the, the rounded portion. Yeah, than. I mean, it's proposed on this side, but if you wanted to move it there, it's, yeah, it's up to you. The construction vehicles cleared the entire okay. front of the house so it's you know i would like to see and I, well, you're not going to have an answer today is if you if we do it that way right and have them take it from the northwest corner as opposed to the southeast w what are we gaining or losing as far as if we don't have them abandon the southern part of gardeners and the western side I, i'd want to see what the you know yeah. The what are we area, trading? The square footage, square yeah. footage, and yeah. what's cleared and what's not already yeah. cleared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, it looks on the map that they would be getting less. See, to me, it looks like they're getting more because of how deep within the front of the house the construction vehicles cleared. Yeah, 
the trees. They cleared right it's, across. Yeah, but the, as Eric said, the overlay. Well, you didn't think the the overlay was quite as accurate as. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe it's not that far off. Yeah. What do they have for a front yard setback? Is that a front yard? No, I don't no, think so. No, so it's a side side yard, it right? Really, even it's so updated. So they would not have actually a front yard. Yeah, I mean, an, another thing. This oh. is something actually. Well, they would if they. <laughs> that, that's I'm, what they're wanting to abandon. Go ahead. See, this is a weird situation here, and something I, I hadn't thought of until now. But another thing, uh, although uh, I don't know, I guess maybe that that crosses the trail there. But I mean, the, the least, if they were going to get access here, the least obtrusive, the smallest amount of area is obviously a straight line. Is that road open? Oh, it is open. Well, okay. these are portions of the right of way right. that the town owns. This is town parcel, so you could just grant an easy. Is that no, a, just, uh, how do we, how do we uh, get that parcel? And then you sever that trail. Well, the town owns the garden of Okay. Well, but then you're splitting the property. So they can cross yeah. that. But that's something the planning board hadn't discussed. I just... Well, the other thing that comes up is if they're now taking access that way, doesn't that mean they'll they'll have frontage on that west side, which means they'll have a front yard, which yeah, yeah, which now gonna... they'll probably need variances because the if it's if it's an easement, then no, they they need to have their front property line along that right of way, which they don't. But the the down. But if it's have... not an easement, then it is a front yard, right? If you conveyed yeah. that but I'm saying you have to road. cross your property here through an easement. So right. um it would it wouldn't make this then a front yard. But the uh, that the only reason I'm mentioning that is just because in terms of area that's the, the least amount of disturbance at, at face value. But also that would prevent that trail from being continuous unless somebody was required to walk over their driveway. So, so I, I don't think, know that I that's think something. One of the things Peter might be getting to is that the design of this house was they're putting their front yard in an area where they're, they, 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 they're putting their front yard. The design of the house has, a, has the front of the house facing the side yard. Right. Where they already know where the front yard was supposed to be, which is the southern entrance. Yeah. I just, so, this is just you know, not. I, I like what Kathy says. You get the apples, the apples on, on square, square footage of. I can get to that. that. Yeah, so I think we've pretty much kicked around every potential scenario here. So I guess we'll um, have another look at this. Yeah. Information and, uh, feel free to send us an email, man. Um, so that's. Um, so would you? So you would like this to? You would like the planning department to get you some more information at, at the very least about the different area calculations for the yeah. different options. Yeah, yeah. And then... the, those different scenarios. I think we have basically three different scenarios. Okay. Um, and then I guess we'll we'll um, come back to the topic before scheduling a public hearing or deciding whether or not to. Right. So the earliest it could get scheduled would be at the 416, or was that the 04? What is the date of that? The 420, the 420 public hearing, you know. So are they under a stop work order now? I believe so, yes. No, okay. we could notice it. On 420, okay. right? Because yeah. he's got to bring it back on 411. We don't have another Thursday meeting until 420. And then it would be in. Um, and then we yeah. have to notice it on 420 for some time in May. So, Eric, also just on the memorandum that was sent to us March 13th, um, on the second page, they've got Gardner's Lane spelled two different ways. I know. So just so we don't confuse everybody else that there are two Gardner's Lane, maybe one is spelled well, maybe one they way. They should be, spelled. Maybe they should be spelled different. The other thing, too, is our agenda called it Gardner's Avenue. So if anybody was checking the agenda, they may not have realized this was in their neighborhood. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually good that we're bringing it back for... Okay. Gardener's with an I in the second one, and it's yep. Lane. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you, Eric. That concludes the work session topics for today. We now we'll go to liaison reports. Kathy, Great. So reports? I do. I wanted to give an update on the design development of the new senior center. R2, as you know, is developing the windmill design with input from their full team to bring the schematic um, design portion to a conclusion. Their current work is further developing the concept and bringing engineering and sustainability criteria to the project. So some of the things that they're developing include the approach to the building uh, front door and the drop-off 
on the site, developing the site amenities, including walking trails, looking at the view corridors, the building form and roof lines, investigating materials for the outer um, portion of the building, as well as plantings, exploring sustainability solutions, as well as fire department access. They've been engaging with the planning department uh, when needed, when they've got questions and with um, Chief Fuzzy Brown, as far as the fire department access. In addition, we've been holding separate meetings um, internally with R2 to discuss and um, the technology programming for the center, including the IT, the security we might need, and our audiovisual needs. And they've also uh, shown us, shared with us, a kitchen design layout to accommodate the in-person nutrition program and the grab and go because they've really become, uh, you know, grab and go has become a big problem. Uh, program and needs uh, a separate space for that. So they are are two scheduled to be here uh, to present on Tuesday, April 18th. They'll be coming into town the day before. And, and as we've discussed, um, I, I, it's nice that they're here because they, they realized the last time around it was more difficult to present at this level via Zoom. So they'll be here and they can... Um, meet with board members and, and go over any questions or thoughts that folks have. Um, and speaking of grab and go, I just wanted to remind people that they are distributed on, it's five frozen meals distributed each week on Wednesdays. If you're 60 and over and interested, you could call 631-324-6711. And uh, there's also a coming up this Thursday is the Easter Passover celebration. Uh, because town hall uh, closes a half day on Friday and the senior center does not open on Friday uh, for lunch because of that. And they wanted me to announce that they'll be serving lamb, mashed potatoes, and coconut custard pie. And there will be a bonnet and fancy tie contest at the center. <laughs> so that, as always, folks start showing up around 1130 and um, lunch gets served soon after that. Um, we also have another upcoming work session I just wanted to let folks know. The Montauk Playhouse Community Center Foundation will be here next Tuesday um, at our work session, and they'll be updating us on the need and the status of the project. Uh, last night, the East Hampton CAC met, but I'm going to reserve that report for next Tuesday, and that's what I have for today. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> David? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the 395 Panago Affordable Housing Project, our internal working team met. We're getting closer as the days go on. Um, we, ha uh, we recently had our test pits dug on there for our water. Uh, we're going to be amending our maps uh, for top topography and also for uh, comments that uh, the chief of the fire department wanted us to put on there and the fire marshal. So we're going to amend the maps and get that all on, and we'll get that to the planning board, we, uh, we hope, for their review in the upcoming month. So that's moving ahead at a, at a good pace. Uh, the Water Quality Technical Advisory Committee met again twice this uh, twice this week. Uh, again, reviewing uh, applications from this calendar year's RFA one, uh, requesting more information uh, from some of the uh, of of the applicants. So that's moving forward, and we're looking forward to getting uh, recommendations. And probably, I would think by uh, uh, by the end, of, potentially by the end of this month. Um, CPF advisory committee met, uh, going over properties, uh, talking some uh, about some uh, some other questions that they had as far as reviewing of, of, of properties. Uh, it was a nice meeting on there. Um, the fisheries advisory committee also met. Uh, we're going to meet again this coming Monday. We're going to work again with uh, the planning department on Monday to try to finalize some movement forward with uh, the working waterfront analysis of properties for short, shoreside commercial fisheries infrastructure. Uh, we're going to be getting a recommendation from them in written, a writing about uh, black, uh, black sea bass uh, regulation changes, uh, how it might affect our fisheries. Uh, that's going in front of MREC, which is Marine Resources Advisory Council from the DEC. Um, they'd like to see the board support some of us, and, uh, and that recommendation will have that, that language there. Uh, also, the FAC discussed um, uh, two things. They discussed a little bit the... Uh, 
first of all, fisheries gear storage, which we've been talking about at our locations and also behind the Westlake Comfort Station. Uh, they're very comfortable with uh, charging a very minor amount for a storage space determined 20 by 20 in that approximation, but also a very minor amount for that on a yearly basis, but knowing that it's important to have a deposit of, let's say, $1,000 is the number they're saying, so that if any gear got uh, left there <laughs> that it, or abandoned, it would be removed uh, with that type of uh, security. Um, we had another internal meeting of the Montauk uh, Bottomlands Inventory, uh, Commercial Bottomlands Inventory. Uh, we're working closer towards uh, getting recommendations to the town board as far as uh, uh, leases that Montauk Bottomlands have. Many have been expired. But also just let the board know where the, where the policy and procedure has been in the past and where we can go forward. I'd like to let everyone know uh, that the Westlake uh, Comfort Station bathroom is actually planned on being installed ahead of schedule and under budget all those nice how oh, often we hear that love that <laughs> nice. yeah. so it's actually going to be installed next week again remember this is a modular unit that's going to be dropped in by a crane it'll be on site first flush will be by the end of the week um they did complete the ia so you having a first flush uh, you got that video for me from amaganza when we did it right <laughs> you know uh maybe we might <laughs> uh Sounds like a ribbon breaking. Ribbon yeah, cutting. Yeah, yeah. Ribbon cutting we want. Paper cut. Uh, paper cut. Very good. Whoa. Uh, so that's going to be installed. The IA system has been installed there also, then, too. Let everyone know about IA systems. The IA system is being installed at the Lions Field Comfort Station by, uh, uh, by the ball fields there. Uh, that is, should be complete by the end of the week. Uh, and we're actually turfing the field, putting uh, putting rolled out grass sod instead of seed to make sure that the, the, the playing field is good for the upcoming Little League season. Uh, talking about the Little League season, uh, opening day is up and coming. Uh, I believe it's on the 22nd. Uh, I want to thank many of the community members and specifically the members of the board, Montauk, uh, sorry, board of the Little League for their preparation of the Little League fields in Montauk, adding clay. They spent money on clay. They were putting it out there and they look great. And I've now, last night on my way to my Montauk CAC, I saw kids already playing on it. So it's, it's great to see. And they look great and they look safe. That leads me into uh, the ball field project at, um, at Stephen Hands Path. That is coming to a final conclusion, actually. I was there first thing this morning, installing the netting, fields in place, they're asphalting um, in storage shed, So and they're putting in sprinklers. So we're, we're pretty much days away from that being complete right now also. Uh, along with that, Buildings and Grounds is working on a full restoration of the comfort station and a, restor a restoration of the five barb and safety elements of uh, the, the the two playgrounds that we have at the location there then too. So it's getting a global look and approach for the for the use that's upcoming. Um, you'll see on the way out the Montauk that the gateway project that uh, uh, Peter's worked hard on with uh, uh, Assemblyman Thiel and also Mr. Keishan, uh is is well underway right now. They're undergrounding all the all the wiring, conduiting. Uh, and soon, very shortly, the poles will be going down, but they are fully mobilized and moving on that, which is great. Uh, Jeannie did hit on to, uh, Jeannie Carrozza did hit on the two things. The beach replenishment bid is out. Uh, this was discussed at the Montauk CAC last night, and also the second house bid is. So I thank you very much for uh, taking the leadership on both of those. Um, I want to let everyone know, once again, and the chamber knows, Montauk Chamber, the town of East Hampton, in, in conjunction with the Montauk Chamber of Commerce, we're having a meeting tomorrow at the Montauk Fire Department at 1.30, uh, in which uh, myself, the supervisor, other department heads, chief of police, marine patrol, fire marshal, building, uh, building chief building inspector, um, code enforcement, the head of planning, are meeting out there with members of the chamber to answer questions on the upcoming season. Uh, we're doing it earlier this season as we have in the past, and I think uh, I think those members of the town for participating. We want to make sure that the town, that everyone's aware of the regulations that we will be looking to go comply, have everyone comply with, and just having an open conversation with everyone. So that's tomorrow. Uh, I believe also I have a date that was set yesterday that. The Montauk, um, that the town, sorry, it's my other book. The town of East Hampton is going to be sending out our planning department. I believe it's going to be in April. We'll get a date. I'll let everyone know next week, in which, like we did last last week, where we'll help them assist them with uh, outdoor dining permits and such, then too. So that's upcoming. Uh, 
uh, Jeremy Samuelson and Jed folks have put that together for a date and that'll be held at the Chamber of Commerce site. And I'll get that date to you. So you also still you can put it to the business advisory committee. Yeah. So so we had uh, Jeremy, which should be at this meeting tomorrow as well. Yes, and he would will. be able to have the, you know, any of the permits and things that are needed for outdoor dining yep. and bring people up to speed on anything with the sidewalk dining that um, uh, we worked on, too. So there, he's going to do a second meeting. No, it's not a second meeting. It's actually going to be an intake of those permits. Okay. So instead of for a property owner, so businesses or property owners to come to East Hampton, we're going to Montauk to them. Okay. Uh, we did it last year at the chamber. And I think we yeah. took nearly a dozen of them and yeah. maybe answered more questions. Yeah. It's just showing our outreach uh, to the Hamlet. Uh, they were they were appreciated last year and it's uh, very minor for us to do and yeah. we're going to do that again. So, so David, I... um, on a foot more on the uh, enforcement meeting, sure. um, would it be possible to for me to pop out and talk about special event permits yeah, let's do it. on That's commercial properties on our beaches? Uh, that we've just made some changes. That's great. Yeah, and help folks uh, understand in advance. Sure. Uh, I also know litter. Uh, I think the uh, member from the litter committee is going to be there right. too, but I think that's great. I know I sent the special event legislation to the CAC, but getting out there to the commercial entities in the chamber, I think that'd be appropriate. Yeah. Key, I would welcome that. Okay. Thanks, Thank David. John's driving for ice cream after anyone. Yeah. I'm in. <laughs> You're in. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you, David. Sylvia. I'm sure the Wayne Scott CAC met on Saturday. We had around 60 folks attended. Uh, the May meeting will be back in the chapel, um, so that'll be the first Saturday in May. Um, David Egan was there to present uh, as the president of the Wainscott School Board. Um, he gave an overview of current conditions at the schoolhouse and, um, and of the tuition students. So they have a total of 116 students um, uh, that they are responsible for, and they are concerned um, about the impact of the school um, on the school from the 114 Community Housing Project, um, that, which is within the Wayne Scott School District. Uh, Mr. Egan and Billy Babinski, who is another school board member, have met with Kathy Burke Gonzalez and with Katie Casey twice, uh, once at the, in December last year, and then uh, March 10th, I think was the other date that I had, that you had also met with both um, David Egan and Billy Babinski. Yeah, well, the, the December meeting was Jeremy and I, and then the March meeting was Katie and I. So um, based on past projects, uh, affordable housing projects that the town um, is involved in, the number of students anticipated for the Wayne Scott School District is somewhere between 35 at a low and 39 right. at it, a yeah. high. Yeah, came in at 35 and we just yeah. to be, you know, plus or minus 10%, so 35 to 39 students. So they, um, within that number, they figured that approximately 10 of those kids would be in the K through 3 program on the actual uh, physical uh, school building. And th the biggest concern that, that uh, David Egan talked about was if 39 number is not an accurate number. And, and how does that, how will the school be able to handle that? Um, he looks forward to continuing the dialogue um, with the town and with the housing authority, Kathy and Katie and Jeremy, anyone else who's involved, to create housing that enhances all aspects of Wayne Scott's community character. Um, we also discussed the airport. Several folks had uh, read the airport DEIS. It's up online. They still had a few questions. They were hoping that um, the uh, that the DEIS would fully explore the possibility of closure, a more fully explore. It's already there, um, and also more fully explore an environmental outcome if closure uh, actually happens. Um, they felt that the DEIS at this point did not do that. I've also been in touch with Dan Rezzo and 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 sent those comments on to him. Um, one member had also suggested that a slot system, he's back talking about the DEIS, that that was not considered within um, the DEIS. And Dan Rezzo um, sent me an email saying that the slot system is inconsistent with general aviation, and therefore no scheduled service is proposed um, for a PPR, which is our prior permission required. Yeah, so, I think slot systems are generally only used major commercial major. airports. And, and we, back in the day, you had know, a look. We, 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 we looked at that one to death. I, I thought back we did 20, figure 2015, out 2015, yeah, it's very complicated to try and do that at, at a... Um, 
So the other uh, issue for the airport, um, I, but these questions come up over and over again. Sure. I mean, right. you know, we just so I just want to get it back out there that we right. that we talked about it, um, that the routes have not been uh, yet disclosed. Uh, I know I've talked with Jim Brundage, Kathy, I think you also talked with Jim Brundage and those will be forthcoming. Um, uh, several members of the committee felt that last summer was unbearable with most of the traffic over Wayne Scott. Uh, and then there was a complaint that last Sunday there were uh, helicopters that took off at 6.30 in the morning. I did try to confirm that with Jim Brundage, and he can find no trace of any through Vector or anybody else that there were helicopters that took off at 6.30. Um, Southwest wind came up, and I know Kate's going to have a much longer discussion about that. So I'm just, these were the two things. Um, we're talking about restoration of Beach Lane at this point, which is always a good thing, which means we're coming to the end of the project. There was one person that said they actually had to raise the level of the road. And so now when they go into their driveway, they go, they go down. Are they going to resurface that? Um, to be all the same level. That was one question. And the other question I think has come up again, uh, over and over again, are they going to take all the millings and any rocks that were put on the side of the road or all those gonna come out before restoration happens? So just again, maybe chat with Jen and or Emily. Oh yeah, I'll find out about the leveling the road, but uh, the restoration project, uh, the millings coming out and rocks coming out the side of the road is the restoration. Okay, and Just, then to and, a seated and, and that's level. not and then, been completed yet. No, no. Uh, the Wayne Scott Commercial Center came up just as a, a point of reference. They recognized that the um, Zoning Board of Appeals had voted 5-0, that the project must meet special permit standards. Um, they again discussed the Suffolk County Planning Commission, who also voted unanimously that the application was incomplete. So they just were acknowledging these things that have already happened with the Wayne Scott Commercial Center. Uh, the gun club came up. Uh, the conversation was the public must have ample time to consider any actions pertaining to a lease. So please make sure that we don't wait until, you know, even August or September that we start discussing it now. They understand that there's uh, litigation going on. Um, they think that higher considerations must be given to the environment, to hikers, bikers that are using the adjoining lands and to current residents that um, may be in distance of the gun club. Um, so additionally, they did say that they would um, support an indoor range if that was something that could be put on the table. And uh, Wayne Scott Tree Society also met. Um, a maple tree was removed on Wayne Scott Hollow Road. Uh, I have to say Kevin Cobb was in great communication with everybody and talked with them all and gave them information. Um, he also made sure that an arborist did come and look at the tree before it was taken out um, and gave them a written assessment of why it was declining and what was happening to the tree and how why it had to be removed. Uh, and he gave, and also sent photos. Uh, so Jeannie Carroza right now is preparing an RFP to have one or more certified arborists at least be able to assist when needed. Um, so Whitmore's arborist uh, actually did us a favor in, in coming out and looking at it. So uh, we want to just make sure that when these things happen again, we just have someone else we can call and we've got them already vetted through an RFP. Uh, two trees are going to be planted on Wayne Scott Hollow Road and uh, with deer protection, as uh, Kevin Cobb was requiring. And again, I have to say, Kevin showed pictures of, of how the, 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 um, the I guess, <coughs> surroundings around the tree trunks needs to be done. And he puts up towels soaked in, I have to get this right, garden mint deer repellent so that the deer will stay away and they won't eat the bottom leaves. So he's gonna help the Tree Society also accomplish that. So, so thank you again, Kevin. Um, public safety partnership meeting is what David was at, talking about earlier. This is gonna be in Montauk. It's, and I also sent the poster to um, Joanne Pilgrim so she can post it on our social media platforms as well. Uh, 1.30 um, on Wednesday at the Montauk Firehouse. 
And um, because of that, our business committee was early or going to be a little bit early in the day. We've actually moved the business committee uh, to April the 19th, which is, again, a Wednesday. And we'll have a debriefing of what's happened at that, with some of the questions, anything that the business committee can work on. Um, and then we also wanted to several folks were going out of town during that um, that Easter um, or spring break and Passover week. So uh, we moved it to the 19th. Uh, Brooks Park, we had a the pre-application for a grant with um, uh, Preserve New York was, uh, uh, the pre-application was approved. This is grant 655.1. And um, they needed additional information for the next step. So Scott Wilson, Michael Devonshire, and I both answered the questions that um, were needed uh, for the next step. Um, and uh making sure that everyone understood the importance of it to the community and as an update uh janet jennings esperanza leon jonathan foster and marietta garvis uh went last friday to start packing up any of the artifacts that were um, <laughs> remaining that were significant uh thanks scott wilson for making sure they could get in and and everything was um open for them so uh Thank him as, uh, as I said, thank him as well. They pa packed up nine boxes uh, from Charlotte's studio. Uh, they took photos. They had contacted Stephen Long from the East Hampton Historical Society to make sure that that what they took, you know, north, south, east, west photos. They made sure everything was documented. Um, so they also want to thank him. And there's still more work to be done, so they'll keep moving forward and, and making sure. Um, and those boxes are being stored over at the Baker House right now. Um, we also received a um, letter. Everyone, I guess, received it yesterday from the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation, along with Preservation League of New York State. Um, just remind everyone, the National Trust for Historic Preservation said that Brooks Park was 11 to save that we're in the most danger in the United States um, this past year. And the Preservation League named Brooks Park the seven to save. Um, so just reading partly what they said, um, preserving this collection of historically significant structures where Charlotte Park and James Brooks, two very important abstract artists lived and work is essential. We would, um, we urge the town to make meaningful steps to ensure that the long-term preservation and reuse of this property is ongoing. So um, i am move from that into our own East Hampton Arts Council. And every year for the past seven years, they have um, helped with March Madness. Now, I know we probably a lot of us watched the game last night. Um, wow, I don't see a lot of heads. I, I watched. <laughs> it, was late. it was kind of a blowout, too. It was, it late. was sort of a blowout. I but anyway, for too long, congratulations early. to our neighbors in Connecticut. Well, <laughs> so, my prediction came true. Um, so the other part of my bracket was completely, was completely blown, blown up early. Up, yes. <laughs> um, so. Uh, so the East Hampton Arts Council does March Madness with the East Hampton High School. And so they've, as I said, been participating for the past seven years. That, And we um, supply them with these uh, four foot by four foot boards for each class to participate in an art project that has a theme to it. So this year's theme, one word, mosaic. And so each of these um, uh, boards had to be done with a, a, with a ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, and a new one that they did. So they now have five is called the life skills class. Um, so you have in front of you uh, what the, it looked like or what the boards all looked like. And then two members, Teresa Lawler and Scott Blue Dorn were the judges for the competition. And you can see that the um, mosaic that won was um, done by the life skills class, which is a heart surrounded by many, many colors of hands all around it. So, and I think some of the, the so, uh, these are really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so now they've done almost 30 panels that are hanging at the high school. And they're really impressive when you go in there because they are four by four, they're bright. And again, I thank the East Hampton High School and the East Hampton um, Arts Council for doing this project for so many years and staying with it. And our own Parks and Rec who help us who make, build the boards for them and, and get them over to the, to the high school so i think that's it that's all i have thank you sylvia okay those are beautiful sylvia yeah they're great 
Um, uh, thank you, Peter. The spring CAC met on uh, March 21st. Uh, the Springs Corridor Subcommittee expressed concerns about businesses that can operate without a CO. And what they're referring to is outdoor space rentals of businesses that are coming up where contractors can rent out a small space and keep their equipment. And uh, they can operate uh, without a CO uh, because there is no structure. They're asking for a code amendments to circumvent businesses from operating without perfecting their site plan conditions and obtaining a CO, even if there are no structures on the property. Uh, the litter subcommittee spoke about the no fling spring events, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and they had a question about our ability to put no household trash stickers on the garbage cans as it beaches, as we all know. Many times folks are bringing their household trash and depositing it in the cans there. Um, I don't know if signage would help, but they feel uh, it could be a deterrent for some folks. Uh, there was a discussion on the restoration of Brooks Park, uh, particularly narrowing it down, the Brooks Studio. Um, folks who were in favor of it talked about uh, preserving the history uh, and also the uh, uniqueness of the property, the 11 acres, as an intersection between nature and art. Um, folks who are concerned are concerned about uh, uh, the an unknown future of who's running it, how they'll run it, and the economics of, <laughs> of being able to make to run it. So those were the the main points of the discussion. Uh, this uh, past few weeks, I've had the South Fork Wind monthly compliance meetings and the biweekly compliance meetings. The monthly is attended by all state agencies and the Long Island Railroad, and um, and uh, they have been doing water testing and monitoring for the permit conditions while they're uh, working at the TJ Bay location, which is at the end of Beach Lane. And uh, the good news is that no exceedance were reported uh, or observed there uh, in terms of water testing. Well, the cable is now onshore, it's been uh, brought onshore and the vessels have left the area. We were recently notified that there will be a 24 hour work uh, condition at the landfill site on Beach Lane beginning Tuesday, April 3rd, and will continue through Tuesday, April 8th. This work is allowed for completion of the cable installation activities and will be performed pursuant to Article 7, uh, con uh, Certificate Condition 75. I've been in touch with South Fork Wind, and as this is a holiday weekend, I've asked for a moratorium on at least the Sunday, uh, for Saturday night to Sunday night for overnight work. Um, and I, I, they will uh, get back to me on that. Um, uh, Jen Garvey uh, also supported that as well. Um, the, the town has also been notified. We were notified via email uh, and in letter of an extension of time request for the final paving of Beach Lane. The request was to extend the times allowed for work on town roads through May 22nd. Uh, this, the demobilization part and the road right of way restorations, which is seeding to 80% germination. Well, the germination won't happen before April 30th, clearly, but the, that part of will. What they're asking for more time is the actual cleanup and final paving of Beach Lane. And as you know, we had weather conditions that delayed the cable installation. Um, there is an option uh, to consider that the road stays temporarily um, covered and they come back after the moratorium in September. Um, my recommendation is that they we uh, grant the extension and they get the work done before the season um, <coughs> and leave it as, as, as it should be in great shape. I, I, I agree with that, Kate. I think, you know, before things really get busy that we'd like to see that all completed, cleaned up and paved. Uh, rather than wait until September. Or to patch it and have patches all right. summer. I think yeah, I think be... let's get the shoulders cleaned up yeah. and the road paved and nice and neat for the season when the weather gets really nice. I, I also support that. that so request we would for need a town board resolution, John? Thursday? For Thursday, yeah. Thanks. Um, the Litter Action Committee is gearing up all over the place. They've been out to Montauk. They've been out to the CACs there. As David said, they're coming to the chamber. They have uh, a number of pickups uh, kicking off on Earth Day, April 22nd, on Springs Fireplace Road, the meeting place, and it'll be north 
of the county road on the actual town on right road so that's north of woodbine yeah. um and uh, people can sign up and meet at Ashwa hall at 9 a.m on a the 29th of april there'll be one in wayne scott village uh, on bathgate uh, on may 6th the uh w in conjunction with the trustees and susan mcgore keeper they'll be doing cleanup at lazy point may 13th uh, with uh, david cataletto for atlantic beach and um there's another one scheduled. I'll have more information for Montauk and uh, another one for Springs Close Highway in Amagansett. They'll be uh, starting a table at the Springs Farmer Market to inform folks about littering, uh, Don't Trash Each Hampton effort, and also some of uh, our regulations regarding covering your load on the road uh, when you're bringing garbage to the dump or uh, transporting anything out of the back of uh, pickup open trucks there's a lot of stuff that falls out that's picked up there by these groups that have adopted the highway there it's a continual effort particularly by the recycling center um let's see there's some other events that i'll speak about because they're later uh, but i just want to highlight that on may 24th the video competition Petition will uh, be judged on uh, at 7 p.m. at LTV Studios, and we will award the winners for the PSA video that we uh, we approved uh, the uh, the guys to do. Um, let's see. I also. Um, the composting, we have a composting work group now. Um, we're meeting on Fridays. This group now includes Ian Calder Piedmont. Piedmont from Balsam Farms, uh, Gloria and Paul from the Energy Sustainability Committee. It is a subcommittee of the Energy Sustainability Committee. We've harnessed Mark Harbner, who is Riverhead Environmental Advisory Committee co-chair. Uh, they created a, a food scraps uh, composting program in Riverhead that's successful. We've harnessed Mary Morgan uh, from South Hold Civic Group and Drawdown. She uh, helped create the South Hold Towns Food Scraps Pilot Program, very successful. Uh, Biddle Duke is also on from the Energy Sustainability Committee. Tony Romano from Ecological Cultural Initiatives, and they are a great resource. They're running a, uh, a small compost food scraps program um, up in Hampton Bays, and the whole idea is to for folks in East Hampton for us to develop pilot programs so we can cut food waste out of our waste stream and save folks can save money by doing so. And that's what I got. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we are continuing to work on putting together the easement document packets for the FIMP stand only beach replenishment in downtown uh, that should be done i think later this week and they'll be sent off to the army corps of engineers to be reviewed um, as i've said before we're looking to try and get this project on track uh, asap uh, hopefully this year um, we're making progress and uh, i'm confident that we'll be able to see uh, this project move forward in the coming months, much needed. We This time of year, we're normally talking about sand replenishment for the downtown area, uh, winter storms this year, and just regular wave action, I think, uh, more than just storms, have, have lowered the beach profile considerably. Uh, we'll do the flyover and put out to bid the uh, sand replenishment but the federal project is significantly larger, would extend the beach berm uh, out over 7,000 feet uh, from, uh, you know, the western uh, road end where the Benson Preserve is uh, all the way to Shadmore. And uh, this would be uh, over 450,000 cubic yards of sand initially uh, with a four-year replenishment, fully uh, federally funded uh initial project um, so we're excited to see things moving forward on that there'll be outreach directly to um, some of those property owners uh, we did get permission uh, to for that project to be extended we'd ask the court to consider extending it to shadmore on the eastern end so there are some additional easements that we would need to put in place so we're working on that um, we had a meeting a week ago Monday with the Playhouse Foundation on talk. Uh, 
concerning uh, working out a partnership to try and move that uh, aquatic center project forward. We'll have a presentation here at the town board work session, um, hopefully this month, if not early May, uh, about that uh, proposed plan. We're trying to work out uh, some of the intricacies of the public par private partnership. We are the landlord and property owner. There are um, protocols and procedures we have to follow regarding, uh, you know, public bidding process as well as, uh, you know, prevailing wage labor requirements as well. So just trying to work out the interface um, and talked about forming a um, uh, construction uh, committee with both town staff and uh, playhouse staff to make sure that everything runs smoothly and we're covering all our bases. Uh, we had uh, the kickoff meeting of the 375th celebration committee. This is the 375th year of the town's founding back in 1648. So we're looking forward to having, uh, you know, a celebration kickoff probably in June. Uh, the committee um, membership includes um, Guild Hall, uh, the Montauk Amagansett uh, Libraries, the East Hampton Historical Society, the Spring School. We had uh, three different school superintendents, Adam Fine, Deborah Winter, and um, uh, Seth Turner from Amagansett uh, on the, on the uh, committee, Hugh King, our town historian, um, Ellen Harrison, Dr. Uh, uh, Georgette uh, Greer Key from Eastville. Uh, it was a really great uh, community coalition of uh, different groups. Uh, we are trying to expand out within each of the hamlets and have uh, celebrations within the hamlets, uh, particularly the hamlets staged over a number of months. Um, culminating in a uh, parade, uh, the 350, excuse me, 375th uh, anniversary parade. We had a parade back in uh, 25 years ago for the 350th. Uh, Main Street was shut down for much of the day. It was a really terrific event. We'd like to duplicate that. We have a tentative date set for um, September 23rd. So save the date. Um, the village, uh, we're coordinating with the village as far as the, the logistics of, of the parade. Uh, they've uh, graciously uh, agreed to um, host and to, you know, work with the DOT for the road closure and coordinating um, police, et cetera. Uh, I think it'll be a great opportunity to celebrate that 375th anniversary and also celebrate uh, all those, the very diverse community we have, all those who've participated uh, in um, creating this town uh, throughout its history, from the uh, indigenous people to the uh, everyone else who's come since, um, basically. So we want to make sure we're represent, representing uh, the great diversity that we have here as well as part of that celebration. Um, Kathy and I met with the CSEA um, uh, leadership. Uh, the CSEA uh, comprises a major portion of the town's workforce. Their contract is up at the end of this year. Um, they have uh, demonstrated interest in beginning negotiations ahead of that expiration. Um, we had a very, uh, I think, productive uh, initial informal meeting with them and in the coming months we'll be having more discussions uh, as we move forward uh, we we understand um, that uh, there there are a lot of pressures on people who live and work here in town and uh, many of them relate to monetary situations uh, exacerbated by housing issues we need to stay competitive within the market we compete with other municipalities and private sector for our employees. And it's important that we, um, you know, address and recognize, um, you know, the, the challenges that we have in staying competitive. Um, 
and we also acknowledge the um, the great resource, the human resource that we have with our town employees and the great job that they do. The uh, community deserves the best possible services, and um, those are provided by our excellent staff. And to the extent that uh, we can support them and uh, expand uh, where necessary uh, that resource uh, to provide the best services within town, which the community deserves and, and demands that uh, we're going to work to do so in a, in a way that's, uh, you know, fair and equitable. Uh, so we look forward to further conversations with the, the union, the town property management committee met. We are now going to be meeting on a quarterly basis instead of when it's been nine years, hard to believe since I founded that committee time goes by. Uh, the committee was originally founded to deal with orphan properties that the town had, uh, and we've been very successful in um, dealing with a number of those properties, um, Fort Pond House, Duck Creek, uh, that that renovation of Duck Creek Barn, the, uh, the barn at uh, the Farm Museum. Uh, we've dealt with Second House restoration. Um, did a lot of the legwork on on Brooks Park in terms of um, working out uh, templates for outside ent entities to manage uh, town properties. Uh, but at this point, we've run through a uh, Boys and Girls Harbor is another one. Mm. So we've run through most of the properties that we initially set out to uh, to deal with. There are still some some town properties, but um, you know until unless and until the town board, you know, decides to task the committee with moving a, a property for, we're going to meet quarterly. Um, let's see. David mentioned the gateway project where we're working to underground uh, the utilities and remove the poles and wires at the entrance to Montauk. That's, so uh, nice. that's one of the, my favorite views in town from, from highway coming into Montauk and seeing the ocean there and looking over the hamlet of Montauk. And uh, that view will be improved so much more. Uh, so the aesthetics of removing the utility lines there and along the old highway, we worked with the uh, private sector on that, um, has really improved that view, but it's also improved the resiliency, uh, storm resiliency, uh, by getting those lines undergrounded. So we're hoping to try uh, to have have those poles removed and that view uh, in place for Memorial Day this year. Nice. Uh, if everything works smoothly with all the various utilities that we have to uh, contract with, um, you know, you have the cable vision and you have PSEG and I said cable vision, Altice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This month. Um, so coordinating with all those different utilities, uh, Verizon and whatnot to get the wires off the poles buried. The uh, private um, property um, connections as well. Uh, so that's all underway and so far going smoothly. And that's all I have for today. And we do have a few resolutions. Yes, let me. I have the first one. Grab it out. I'd like to offer a resolution uh, 2023 456, which is a one year agreement for ESRI ARC GIS maintenance contract. This is where the town has retained Environmental Systems Research Institute, uh, which granted the town of East Hampton access to the ESRI software on an unlimited basis, including maintenance on all software offered through the ELA for the terms of the agreement. And the town wishes the, to extend the ESRI ARC GIS agreement for an additional year of service for a period of May 4th through 2023 through May 4th, 2024. And ERIS submitted a proposal dated March 2nd that provided such services uh, with an annual subscription at set cost to the town, not to exceed $990 for the agreement year. And whereas uh, a sole source letter was provided by ESRI further indicating that they are the only source that maintains such project. Now be it uh, resolved that the town supervisor is hereby authorized to execute all documents 
to enter to the ARC G, it should be GIS instead of ARC GS maintenance agreement with the Environmental Systems Research Institute Inc. for a one year uh, contract at the annual fee of $990. Second is amended. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed and carried. Resolution 457 is detective training. And that is to authorize um, training with the town police department. <clears throat> this is a approval sought retroactively for the town detective unit to attend the cellular records and uh, tower dumps preparation for court sponsored FBI National Academy Associates. And that was held on March 31st, 2023, uh, not to exceed $150. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed and carried. Resolution 458. It's a budget modification, the 2023 capital plan funding. It's resolved that the town board directs the budget office to make the following budget modifications to authorize each respective capital plan project. We have... Um, Four different uh, lines here from appropriated under reserve fund balance in the amounts of one million fifty six thousand three hundred dollars, four hundred and twelve thousand five hundred dollars, fifty thousand dollars, and forty four thousand dollars. The one million fifty six thousand three hundred dollars is transferred to other funds. Four hundred twelve thousand five hundred is transferred to other funds, as is the fifty thousand and the forty four thousand in various budget line accounts. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed. Carried. That concludes our regular agenda. I make a motion to go into exec session. I make a motion we go into exec session for CPF, contracts, leases, easements, and personnel. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed. Carried. It is 150. Shall we reconvene at 230? Sure. Does that work for people? Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, Jason. Stay well, everyone. All good, everybody.